Thank you very much, Chair. I can confirm that we are now live. Thank you very much. So welcome everybody to South Cam's District Council Planning. <coughs> uh, my name is John Batchelor and I'm chair of the committee. Um, could uh, everybody mute, please? There's quite a bit of background noise going on. Thank you very much. Um, I just need to check if Councillor Hailing, the vice chair, is with us. Councillor Hailings, are you with us? No, I did have a note that she wasn't feeling very well. So um, uh, at this point, um, uh, since Councillor Hailings is not with us, um, members of the committee, are you happy no. that Councillor no. Hailings sits in? Anybody Agreed. Say? I'm happy, Chairman. Agreed. OK, thank you very much. I'll carry on with the um, introduction. Um, on the top table, we have um, various officers, which I'll now introduce. Um, it's Chris Carter, he's the delivery manager for strategic sites. Mr. Carter, are you with us? Good morning, Chair. Yes, I'm here. Good morning, everybody. Um, we also have Stephen Reed, senior planning lawyer. Are you with Good us? morning, Chair and members of the committee and public. Thank you very much. And Ian Senior from Democratic Services, who will be taking the minutes. Are you with us, Mr. Senior? You're muted, but I think we can see you there. Thank you very much. Um, case officers, I will introduce um, when they come to speak. So a few housekeeping announcements. Please make sure that your device is fully charged and switch your cameras and microphones off unless you are invited to do otherwise. When you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure that your microphone is switched on. When you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone and camera immediately. Speak slowly and clearly and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone. Please ensure that you have switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt proceedings. The normal procedure at planning committee is to take recorded votes and we will continue with this unless there is a clear affirmation. When we move to a vote on any item and there isn't clear affirmation, I will ask for a roll call to be taken. I will then ask committee members to speak into the microphone so that their vote is clear both to committee and to those watching the webcast. Members should respond for, against or abstain. Committee members present, I will now invite each of you to introduce yourselves. Members, after I call your name, please turn on your camera and microphone. Wait two seconds and say your name and the ward you represent so that your presence may be noted. Please remember to turn your camera off after your introductions. Uh, as I said earlier, my name is Councillor John Batchelor. I'm committee chair and one of the members for Leeds. Uh, Councillor Bradman, please. Good morning everyone, I'm Councillor Anna Bradnam and I'm member for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Thank you. Councillor Khan, please. Hello, uh, I'm Councillor Khan and I'm member for Distant Impington and Orchard Park. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Fain. Peter Fain, member for Shelford. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Dr Hawkins, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm Councillor Timmy Hawkins and I'm the member for Caldicott Ward. Thank you. Uh, I will call Councillor Haylings, but I don't think she is with us. No, I don't. So Councillor Haylings is not with us this morning. Councillor Ripeth, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm Councillor Ripeth and I'm a member for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Roberts, please. 
Good morning, everybody. Um, Deborah Roberts, District Councillor Foxton Ward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Morning, I'm Heather Williams and I represent the Mordens Ward. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Willi Richard Williams, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm Richard Williams and I'm the member for the Whittlesford Ward. Thank you. And Councillor Wright. Good morning, everyone. Councillor Nick Wright, Caxton and Patworth Ward. Thank you very much. So I can confirm that the meeting is quiet, uh, but Councillor Halings is not with us this morning. Uh, thank you very much. Um, could everybody please turn off their cameras and mute their microphones, please? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Khan, are you having a problem with your equipment? Perhaps he is. Uh, we'll come back to that. So, uh, carry on. No, I had some problem at the beginning, but it seems to be okay now, for the moment at least. Okay, we just got a big picture of you on the screen. That's all. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll carry on then. So, uh, if at yeah. any time a member leaves the meeting, would they please make that fact known to me so that it can be recorded in the minutes? So members of the public are aware if a councillor is absent for any part of the presentation or, or the debate about an agenda item, then they may not vote on that item. And that does include um, technical issues. We have several public speakers today and I'd just like to explain how public speaking will work. This meeting is being broadcast live via the Council's website and public speakers are reminded that by participating in this meeting you are consenting to being broadcast and to the use of images and sound recordings for webcast and training purposes. You will each have three minutes to address the committee. When you start speaking, we will start the timer. Please ensure you switch the microphone on before you speak. When your time has elapsed, we will ask you to conclude your speech. Once you have finished speaking, we may wish to ask you questions. Please be concise in your responses if there are no more questions, you may leave this meeting and continue to watch via the webcast. Committee members are reminded that any questions to speakers should be for clarification purposes only. And the process for this shall be as follows. I shall ask if there are any questions. If you do have questions, please ask to speak in the chat function. The committee can only consider planning reasons for or against the application. The planning committee will then vote. The outcome is decided by majority vote and in the event of a tie, I as chair have casting vote. When planning committee members vote, please can they ensure that they identify themselves and speak into the microphone so that the vote is understood by the committee and those watching the webcast. Members are reminded that they should indicate whether they are for, against or abstain when their name is called. <clears throat> Today, uh, as you will know, is the 11th of November and Remembrance Day. Um, so at 11 o'clock today, I will um, stop proceedings in order to observe uh, a two-minute silence. 
So my apologies if anyone in particular is speaking at that time, but we, we will um, um, observe those two minutes as <laughs> at 11 o'clock. Um, just before we go on, Councillor Thane, you are not muted and we are having some background noise from you. If you wouldn't mind to muting, please. Thank you very much. Um, so we go on to apologies. Uh, this is senior. Do we have any apologies? Thank you, Chair. Just one apology then from Councillor Pippa Havings. All right, thank you very much. Um, we now go on to item three, which is declarations of interest. Um, would anybody who got a declaration of, of interest please indicate that they'd like to speak? Chairman, Deborah, can I speak please? Yes, uh, Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. I'm a member of Falmere Parish Council and we have an agenda item for Falmere. Um, I was at the meetings when it was discussed, but I come to it today afresh. Thank All you, right. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, any other members? Yes, Chair. Any, yeah. Councillor Thane. You're muted. You're, mu you're muted, Councillor Thane. Thank you. I'm, I am a, in relation to item eight, Chairman, I'm a member of Great Shelford Parish Council. And because one of the immediate neighbours to that application is a former parish councillor and a friend, I will be recusing myself on that item. OK, thank you very much. Uh, any others? Uh, I have a declaration myself on item seven, Great Abington, and on number nine for Linton. I am the local member for both these uh, villages. Um, I have been present at parish council meetings when the issues have been discussed. I haven't taken any part and I am um, looking at these afresh today. So if there's no more declarations of interest, we will move on to item four, which is the minutes for the meeting uh, held on the 14th of October. Members, do we have any issues of accuracy on those minutes? <clears throat> uh, yes, Cam uh, Councillor Heather Williams, is that you wish to speak? Thank you, Chairman. It was just that I had recorded um, I did ask it to be recorded that I was going to abstain for the uh, minutes, which isn't in these minutes. OK, I'm sure that, that is noted. So not these minutes, but in the, in the minutes of the previous meeting, the <laughs> one for the um, the August meeting. OK, so you're being a correction of that one. Yes. OK, that's noted. Councillor Fain, did you wish to. A point of accuracy on the minutes? No, not at this point. No, OK. Well, I don't see anybody else. So members, are you happy that uh, I sign these minutes of a true record of the meeting we have held on Wednesday the 14th of October? Agreed. 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 Uh, no one against? No, good, OK. So they are agreed. In that case, we move on to the substance of today and our first application. Chairman, sorry yes. to interrupt, um, and apologies if it's if I've missed it through technical issues. But have we actually officially appointed Councillor Fain as your vice chair? Yeah, I did it during the, my introductory speech, but, but we can certainly do it again. So, so I thought we had to propose the second and vote. I just. I missed that point, but I was experiencing oh, OK, well, I'm happy to propose that. Um, happy to second it, Chairman. Good. Uh, anyone against? I don't see anybody being against. All no. agreed. So happy we do that by affirmation. Agreed. Um, it should also be noted that since Councillor Thane has 
um, declared um, some interest in um, item eight, um, then we, we may need to look for another vice chair for that particular um, application. All right, we're now on agenda five, <coughs> which is land adjacent to Moore's Meadow, Great Shelford. It's application 4279-19FL. The proposal is for the erection of 21 dwellings, arms houses, relocation of existing allotments and public space provision together with associated landscaping and infrastructure. <clears throat> the applicant is Great Shelf for Parochial Charities. Uh, key material considerations um, are that uh, the planning committee decision which we made on the 10th of June and mortgagee in possession clause. This will all be explained um, shortly. The application is coming to the committee because on the 10th of June, the planning committee gave officers delegated authority to approve the application subject to, to one, the completion of a legal agreement under the Town and County Planning Act 1990 to ensure that the properties remained affordable in perpetuity and the future maintenance and management of various elements of on-site open space and two, the conditions and the informatives set out in the officer's report. All works have progressed on the legal agreement um, and the need to include a mortgagee in possession clause has arisen, which was not present to the planning committee on the 10th of June. The application is therefore brought back to the planning committee to advise members of the need for an MIP clause and seek members endorsement. The officer recommendation is for approval. The presenting officer is Michael Sexton. Mr Sexton, could you introduce this please? Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll share my presentation. Chair, could you confirm that you can see a presentation on the screen, please? I can. Um, yes, thank you. A lot of this will repeat what um, Councillor Matra has just said, but I'll try and go through it fairly quickly. The application, yes, is for 21 affordable houses in uh, Great Shelford with associated allotments, public open space, landscaping and infrastructure. Uh, just to remind members, but I'm sure you recall, it's a site on the eastern edge of Great Shelford. Um, adjoining the framework boundary and in the green belt. The landscape master plan shows the relocated allotments in the northern section of the site, an area of open space in the middle of the site, and then the new affordable, 21 affordable houses in the southern portion of the site, uh, which have been designed around being uh, a green belt location, uh, an area of central green, green space and green roofs, as you can see on this slide here, um, how they uh, blend themselves into the landscape. Um, <clears throat> and as yes, Councillor Baxter says, and it says in the committee paper, members reviewed the application on 10th of June 2020 um, and grant, uh, uh, granted the officer's delegated authority to approve subject to the, uh, the, the minutes of that meeting, so I won't repeat again. So the reason we're here today is while completing the Section 106 agreement, it's come to light that a mortgagee in possession clause is required as part of the Section 106 agreement. Um, in short, uh, a MIP clause gives lenders comfort that they will be able to take possession of properties unfettered by restrictions if the housing provider defaulted on the payment of the loan. Without a MIP clause, housing providers can't borrow as much money to help fund the development. So there's a, a few figures there showing the slight difference in what you can borrow. For the purposes of this application, the applicant has provided evidence to us that by virtue of delivering a site for 100% affordable housing, they're unable to access traditional development finance and the delivery of the project will therefore rely on a combination of grant funding and ethical loan products over and above the applicant's own interest uh, investment. Um, where this sits in policy terms, the, the inclusion of a MIP clause would accord with national and local planning policy. So policy H11 is the relevant local plan policy in this instance. And I've underlined the, the relevant section, part D of the policy that says mortgagee and possession clauses 
will be allowed where it demonstrated to be necessary to enable the development to proceed. As I mentioned earlier, we have had evidence from the, the applicant that they do require a MIP clause to deliver the, the development. Um, in Greenbelt terms, the MPPF sets out that uh, a local planning authority should regard construction of new buildings as inappropriate development in the Greenbelt. Exceptions to this include limited affordable housing for local community needs under policies set out in the development plan. So that ties back to policy H11. So uh, national and local level use of a MIP clause on this development would accord with planning policy. So yes, that is the, the key material consideration in this instance, um, the inclusion of a MIP clause. Uh, so the MIP clause would accord with national and local policy. Um, the inclusion is supported by officers, including the Affordable Council's Affordable Housing Team. Uh, where MIP clauses have been agreed on other sites in the district, it's not been the case that because of that clause, the dwelling has needed to become um, open on the uh, available on the open market and thus thus no longer affordable in perpetuity. Um, to sort of reassure members that even if it was to be a default one part of the mortgagee, the section 106 agreement will contain a proviso that the local authority should first be given an opportunity to acquire the uh, the property. So the risk of losing an affordable dwelling on this site remains very remote. And just I suppose to cover everything that there are no other changes in circumstances to the application itself or the or relevant planning policy since the previous resolution to grant in June. Therefore, officers are recommending that the committee again um, grants permission for this development um, with all the same reasons as before, but with the inclusion of a MIP clause. Um, I do have Julie Fletcher, the uh, head of housing strategy with us today, and I think she would like to just speak at this point, Chair, as well before we move on, if that's OK. Yes, that's fine. Hello Chair, hello Planning Committee. Um, so I'm Julie Fletcher, Head of Housing and Strategy. Just want to say really that I fully support the application for a MIP for this reason. It's slightly different in terms of the applicant is not a registered housing provider that's regulated by Homes England, but they it has been brought forward as a community-led development. And they are a long-standing sort of charity within the village. I think they were established in 1890 to provide alms houses for local people. And actually, the affordable housing offer it is better than the traditional offer from the housing providers. So we fully support the scheme and believe it's a really good scheme. I'm satisfied that they do require it to be able to um, get the finance that they need in terms of bringing the scheme forward and without the inclusion of a MIP they would not be able to borrow the amount required and therefore wouldn't be able to bring forward the scheme which would be a great shame. Um, they are also applying for grant funding through the combined authority and this will reduce the amount of loan requirement that they will seek but they will still need the MIP clause in it. Um, we do feel that the MIP clause risk in terms of um, bringing forward and losing, potentially losing the affordable housing um, because there are safeguards in place. I do have a point of clarification in terms of the recommendation chair, which I wonder whether I should um, just highlight now. Yes, please. Um, so within the recommendation, it does say that um, to ensure that the properties remain affordable in perpetuity, um, the, the whole thing really with a MIP clause is that, that we cannot completely guarantee that the homes will remain affordable in perpetuity if such circumstances happen that they did default on the loan and we were unable to put all those safeguards in place. I feel it's highly unlikely, but for the sort of technical purposes, I don't think we can say in perpetuity within the recommendation. And I would ask that that's removed so that the properties just remain affordable. So you were simply suggesting we take that word out. Yep. Yes. So it now reads remain affordable and the future maintenance and so on. So that that's simply the one word. Yeah. Okay. Noted. Okay. Ha happy to take any questions on sort of technical. That's right. Yeah. We're, we're coming to clarification in, in just a moment. Uh, okay, members. Any. Um, um, Councillor Fain, do we have any 
Yes, we have some clarification. Councillor Heather Williams wanted to speak. Thank you very much. Councillor Williams, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just mine was clarity around the perpetuity um, and also the the MIP is something that we've not had before and I, it doesn't sound like it's very common. I have to say thank you very much to Michael um, for explaining it. Um, but I think in future, if there's something completely new like this, it would be very helpful for members to be briefed ahead of the meeting and have some sort of training and support for it. On, on the cases of perpetuity, we said about um, the council being first first to sort of get the, to be able to buy it in the event that they need to be sold. But I'm just wondering how that works with the right to buy, because actually, housing um registered housing providers are able to secure things in perpetuity and because they have the right to acquire not the right to buy so how so we obviously can't guarantee if we were to buy them and i think what was very important you know i'm supportive of this site but we we need we need to be clear on that and the other thing on perpetuity is recently members were given the opportunity to do the uh, go on the gcp site tour for the cambridge southeast and I was wondering how this fits, or is there potentially going to be um, compulsory purchase, in which case we wouldn't be able to guarantee in perpetuity because of the alignment that's proposed. So to be clear, I, you know, we all supported it, but that perpetuity seems to be a bit of a tricky spot. And if I can have some clarification as to those areas, I'd very much appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, who's going to take that? So I'm happy to clarify. Please do. Okay. Um, okay, so so your first point, Councillor Williams, in terms of the MIP clause being rather an exception rather than the norm, actually it has now become the normal. Um, we, we did do a presentation to planning committee, but I think that was probably a few years back, to be fair. Um, and we do now have it written within our local plan policies in terms of having a, a MIP clause within an exception site because of the perpetuity issue. Um, so, so it is a norm and, and that's come about really in terms of because of the grant funding kind of way for affordable housing. The government um, expect um, housing providers to maximise their assets to, to fund new development. Um, and the only way they could do that is with the inclusion of a MIP clause. So it is general practice now that MIP clauses are included um, with, with the appropriate safeguards and generally it's a registered provider. So there's more stringent safeguards in place in terms of um, their regulation. Um, but happy to do a separate briefing on that if, if that felt valuable. Um, in terms, you, you mentioned sort of perpetuity and I've sort of explained that having a MIP clause you can't guarantee perpetuity because there is always that, that very small risk that the um, housing provider would default on their loan um, and other safeguards couldn't be taken into place and therefore ultimately you would lose that affordable home to the private sector. Um, so, so we can't guarantee that perpetuity but we do believe the risk is small um, and not having the MIP clause um, the risk is much, much greater and significant in terms of not be, being able to deliver that scheme. Um, right to buy. There is no right to buy on this scheme. It is a community led scheme and it will be owned and managed by Great Shelford um, Charities. They have a different type of tenancy agreement which would not allow them to, um, to buy the property. Um, but, so it is more secure in that respect. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure about your point on the CPO. Um, uh, sorry, I didn't quite quite understand that. Um, but obviously, we would always do everything to make sure that homes remain affordable where they can. Chairman, are you happy? Do you want to come back? Yeah, I think the my question about the route alignment is probably more for um, for Michael. Um, but the, my issue on the right to buy wasn't with the parochial. The slides that were shown, it referenced about the council being sort of having the first choice to buy them. Um, 
I, I can't obviously see the slide right now, but that that was referenced, that that was my concern by saying that the council gets first refusal and preference, and would those then be subject to to right to buy? Whereas if a, it, it was a housing, a registered housing provider, then that might not be the case. So what's the what's the thought process between us having first first dibs, as it were? Um, and then I think the other one is is more for for Michael Chairman, if I may. But thank you, Julie, yeah. for your response. OK, so in, in terms of the right to buy, um, it, obviously, you know, we promote affordable um, council housing and we have our own new build programme. So we're obviously, you know, as a council, really promoting that. But we do have the right to buy uh, and we, we cannot get out of that obligation through legislation. Um, the quiet housing, what would happen if we ever did take on the properties, which I have to be honest, I think it's very, very slim. because you know, because the Great Shelford Charities are well established, they've been going since 1890, I think it's such a slim chance, but we would have to look at it and if they took on a tenancy, um, which the council gave, then yes, the right to buy would probably then start to kick in. Um, it, it's, it's something we can't get away off, um, unfortunately, if legislation and less policy changes sometime in the future. All right, thank you very much for that. Perhaps, Chair, if I could. Mr. Sexton, could you come yes. back on that? Yeah, please. Yeah, I'll probably be inviting a few other people to chip in as well. But just for clarity on the, the slide, it simply says that the Section 106 agreement will contain a proviso that the local planning authority should um, give them the opportunity to acquire their property if necessary. Um, perhaps this would be an appropriate point for Stephen Reid just to explain how that works within the legal agreement. Right, yes. Uh, Mr. Reid, would you like to enlighten us? Yes, Chair, if I may, um, the the wording in the 106 agreement gives that uh, that right to the council or in effect the council's nominee. So we we could uh, work with a registered provider uh, to ensure that the uh, the the particular dwelling was held by a registered provider rather than the council, in which case the the theoretical risk of the uh, right to buy would not arise. The other important point I would like to add is um, that um, the number of affordable dwellings that would be sold in the event of default is specifically limited under the wording that we've agreed with the charity such that if for example um, the mortgagee could be paid off by by selling two dwellings rather than say 14 then only two dwellings would be sold to reimburse the mortgagee so that's another important factor that we have built into this agreement and we've also uh, ensured that unlike a situation with a uh, registered provider whereby effectively they will want the the right to uh, mortgage the site even after all of the dwellings are built i.e so they can raise money for another site in this case uh, the mortgage will be limited to the uh, building of these dwellings and if they did want to raise finance post the dwellings being built they would need to come back and uh, seek the council's permission so that's a, another important factor right thank you very much for that chairman okay. you have councillor nick wright and then myself okay councillor wright please thank you chairman um, I, I have my concerns about this. Um, it, it does alter our original decision quite a lot because the perpetuity word was a big attraction, you know, to building an exception site in the green belt. And, you know, looking at this site, it, it's a wonderful development. Everything about it ticked boxes for us. But the fact that it's a very small charity running it does uh, give anxieties 
about how quickly the mortgage in, you know, in possession clauses may come in and uh, cause, cause anxiety. Sorry about this. Right, I beg your pardon. Um, the uh, that will be ten pounds to the chairman's charity, no doubt. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, we'll hold you to it. <laughs> yes, uh, I apologise. Uh, there, there, there we are on clarification, councillor. Yeah. So, is there a question, please? Oh, what's happened there? Oh dear. Councillor Wright, are you still with us? I think he's dropped out, Chair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid we appear to have lost Councillor Wright for the moment. Uh, Councillor Thane, would you like to put your question? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, perhaps I could check uh, with the case officer. This is, in fact, the opposite side of the railway from the proposed CSET busway route, so the compulsory purchase issue wouldn't uh, arise. Um, it's quite clear to me, I think uh, Mr Sexton would confirm that the MIP clause is in line with the relevant policy of the local plan. Paragraph six refers as to any concerns about perpetuity in the long term. This charity has been in existence for 130 years, uh, not exactly a small charity. They own and run 30 wholly affordable uh, houses on the next door to this site. Um, so my intention, I see we now have another speaker, but my intention was to move was to move that we go straight to a vote. I don't know whether I have a seconder for that. Uh, right, thank you for that. I do have uh, public speakers, though I would, would say councillors uh, who are here. If I assume one of those public speakers might be the uh, parish council. Um, you may like to ask them whether they would be happy to move direct to a vote. Chair, would you like me to just clarify the policy position, which yeah, I, yeah, I think is what Mr. Councillor Wright was, okay. Councilor Wright was yeah, going to be alluding yeah. to. Yeah, so policy H11 of the adopted local plan is clear that mortgagee and possession clauses will be allowed where demonstrated to be necessary to enable development to proceed and national planning policy in terms of green bar development allows limited affordable housing in line with adopted development plan policies. So the, the inclusion of a MIP clause is uh, in line with planning policy. The reason we're back here today is because when the scheme was presented in June, officers weren't aware that a MIP clause was necessary. Um, in the period between that committee meeting and today, we have had those discussions. We have had evidence presented to us. Um, obviously, Julie Fletcher has, has looked at that and we are officers are satisfied. So. The, had we had that information in June, we would have been presenting the exact same recommendation because there is no policy conflict with the inclusion of the MIP clause. Obviously, there's yeah perhaps a slight wording in terms of not being able to say perpetuity, um, but I think as Stephen Reed has explained, there are a lot of safeguards within the 106 and there are MIP clauses on other sites across the district um, that have been granted in the not too distant past. And we I'm not aware that the use of a MIP clause on those sites has yet resulted in the loss of any affordable units on those sites. So there is a, a risk, but it's a, a small risk. Um, and as I say, it, it is in line with policy. So there's no planning policy reason to, to say no. Excellent. OK, thank you very much. So we have a proposal from uh, Councillor Fain to go straight to a vote. I will, what I'm going to do now, firstly, I would check that it has a seconder for that and then I will check with the public speakers if they're they're happy for, for us to go ahead on that basis. So Councillor Thane has made a proposal to go straight for a vote. Um, I'm prepared to second that. So we have a, a, a live proposal. Um, so I, I have two speakers who I will now um, ask their views. Um, I think uh, Councillor Kettle, you're, you're, would you mute please? Councillor Kettle, you're, 
We've got a lot of background noise on the line for us. Could you put a few some, please? Thank you very much. Um, is Mike Nettleton with us? Chair, sure, yes, um, hopefully you can see me. Yeah, indeed. Are you happy that we go straight to a vote? I'm not at the moment. Prepared to clarify that. You're not? OK, fair enough. And I just check with um, Councillor Kettle from the Parish Council. Uh, would you be happy if you went to a vote? Obviously, it's an ethical solution. I would be completely happy for us to go straight to the vote. Uh, we are um, really excited about the prospect of the uh, the proposal um, and would really like it to begin as soon as possible. Right. OK, thank you very much. Um, I would just now like to take advice from Mr Carter. Since the applicant would like to speak um, perhaps uh, you could advise on the process, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I don't believe Mr. Nettleton is the applicant, um, so I think he has been noted as a supporter. Oh, right. um, but I, I believe he does have some other comments to make, so I think we should take those comments. And I note that there are also um, members who would like to um, have uh, some period of debate as well, but I'll, I'll leave that matter to you, Chair. But I think we need to hear Mr. Nettleton. OK, thank you very much. All right, so Mr. Nettleton, I'm going to go um, first off. Members, are, are we complete on clarifications with the officers? Yes, thank yes. you. Yeah, thank you. So let's. So, Mr. Nettleton, if you would like to. Thank you, Chair. Presentation, you're, sorry to mess you about, but. Uh, <laughs> Please don't, don't worry about that. Yeah, um, so, You've got your three three minutes, so when, when you're ready then, please. Thank you. Obviously, this is a very important issue because it raises issues around affordable housing and around the green belt. Previously, I've supported this application on balance because I felt it was the only way of actually obtaining truly affordable housing in Great Shelford. However, I think a number of conditions have to be imposed if we're, if we're to allow the development to proceed. The first one is the tenancy terms. And I've been really concerned to hear this morning that there's the chance that the tenancy terms cannot be guaranteed in perpetuity. We are sacrificing Greenbelt land for this development. It's a very worthy development, but we need to make sure um, that there is no right to buy and that the tenancy terms continue to be for residents only and for um, rents around 50% of the market values. So I'd be very concerned if the, if the council were to suggest that we voted in favour of development without that being tied down. The second is related and it's down to protection of the residual land. So the remaining land, um, which is for allotments and for a sort of mini country park, also needs to be protected in perpetuity, such that it can only be used for allotments or public recreational space and not for any form of commercial use. And I think that is really, really important. Third issue we've got is parking. Um, this was raised at a public meeting which the Parish Council organised back in January this year. And there are concerns around parking in the hectare by users of the country park and the allotments. Um, plainly, there will be additional parking in that area. It's an area where parking is already at a premium some form of parking management scheme needs to be devised um, before consent is given to this application. The final thing is the allotments, and I think this, this has largely gone by the board. I'd ask that provision of the allotments be reviewed between the parochial charities and Great Shelford Parish Council before development proceeds. Um, that has been totally ignored, um, and in fact, the the parochial charities have gone ahead with relocation of the allotments in advance of planning commission being granted. Um, to me, that is wrong. So if I can summarise, my, my major concerns are around the tenancy terms, the protection of residual land so it can't be used for, for um, commercial development and also parking issues. Um, thank you, Chair. Obviously happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much. 
Yeah, members, any points of clarification you'd like to raise with Mr. Nettleton? I haven't got any coming through at the moment. No, so thank you very much, Mr. Nettleton. Can I just check then with uh, Councillor Kettle, given that um, Mr. Nettleton has spoken, do you wish to speak as well? Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, with regards to the commencement of work on the allotments, um, I would like to point out that I don't believe that has actually happened as such, only that allotments are a seasonal um, usage of land and therefore those whose allotments are going to be moved for the development have been given permission to begin moving their shed etc onto the new plot not into its actual site as yet but simply to release the land ready for the developers when they come in to start building um, as such there have been some complaints about where the sheds have been relocated and this is being looked into and the sheds are definitely not staying where they are at the precise moment um, and I believe that that is is where the the discussion has come from, um, that um, it was simply a means of enabling the allotment holders to not lose a season of uh, planting. Right. OK, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, I mean, with regards to the parking, um, we are well aware that there have been some discussions about the parking. Um, I thought at the time when it was presented to the, um, the planning committee that uh, these issues were thoroughly discussed. Um, I do agree that parking is a problem in every village and in every area of every village. And it is something that will have to be part of the parochial charities plan. And I believe that they are looking into this matter anyway. All right, thank, thank you very you. much. Yep. Uh, any points of clarification for Councillor Kettle, please? Councillor Williams, was that uh, clarification? Um, it was more the clarification that um, Councillor Cattell has got the permission of her parish council, as I think that might have been missed. Oh yeah, okay, um, thank you very much for that. <laughs> I'll check back. Sorry, uh, Councillor Kettle, um, I, I, just the, for process, I have to ask if you have the permission to speak on behalf of your parish council. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't think there's any further questions on that. Um, local member, uh, Councillor Fain, I take it that you, you didn't want to speak further on at this stage? No, I said all I needed to say earlier on. Thank you, Chair. OK, so what's going to happen now is that um, um, we will debate the motion put by uh, Councillor Fain, and that was to go um, to a vote. So do I have speakers for that, please? Councillor. I'm sorry, Councillor Thane, I didn't catch that. Councillor Heather Williams and Councillor Toomey Hawkins. And Councillor Bradnan. OK, what, which order is that then, please, Councillor Thane? Uh, I have Councillor Bradnam I had down earlier, um, Councillor Williams and then Councillor Hawkins. OK, fine. So Councillor Bradnam then, please. And we're, we're, we're speaking to going to a vote. OK, um, I'm quite happy to have the debate if people want it. Uh, but the um, couple of things, one is that the parish, the, the planning committee has encountered mortgagee and possession clauses before. And uh, I appreciate it might be useful to have an update briefing on it, but we are familiar with the process and why they happen. Um, and in this case, I have I'm I'm reassured by Julie Fletcher's um, comment about it. I think this we know from the looking at the original application that this 
application was really well thought out and is mindful of the community and making provision where it can. Um, and so actually I have no hesitation in supporting this application. And so for that reason, I wouldn't mind if it went straight to the vote, but I'm quite happy for others to, to raise their, their uh, concerns. M my feeling is this has been managed by the charity that lives within the village and knows the village. So it will have um, an obligation to handle this as well as it possibly can. So uh, my feeling is we should have no concerns in that regard. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chairman. I mean, the, the purpose of the debate is to sometimes support as well. It doesn't necessarily mean concerns, but I think we do have an opportunity to tighten this up, given the concerns that have been raised about the tenancy terms. Um, so I might need officers advice as to whether this is possible or not. But in the wording of the agreement, is it possible that rather than the council having the first opportunity to purchase, that we do change that and make it clear that it will be the council's nominee? That way we can hopefully give some reassurance to residents concerned and about the right to buy process if it's clear that it will be a housing association that we will nominate. Um, and is that possible or is it a legal thing that the local authority comes first? So if I have some advice on that, if it is that we can do that, then I would like to move and propose that we do that to give it the best chance of that perpetuity as we can't include it. But, um, but you know, affordable housing is, is definitely something that we, we, I'm sure we all look to, to support. Um, and I believe the parking issues I think we we have the opportunity to deal with that with that back in June. Um, I'm not sure we can revisit that, but um, I'll take advice on that. So mainly about the um, appointing nominee rather than buying it, please, Chairman. Thank you. OK, thank you. Let's uh, take some advice on that. Mr Carter, can you advise us on that? Thank you, Chair. Um, I believe, the, and, and I'm sure Stephen Reid will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the wording at present is um, the council or its nominee. So I, I think that that safeguard is is in there um, and gives flexibility um, to to security in, uh, in that way, as uh, Julie Fletcher described. So the council could nominate it uh, uh, an affordable housing provider um, should that situation arise. So I think the flexibility of wording is sufficient at present. Councillor Williams would be my view. Thank you, Chair. Thank Chairman, you. can I come back uh, from that, please? Hang on a minute. Can, uh, Mr. Reid, I think, wants to add to that. Chair, I, I think if um, Councillor Williams speaks first, then uh, I can hear any comments and address those when I speak. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Williams, would you like to come back, please? Um, yes, thank you, Chairman. Can I just say, because this has been raised obviously by members of the public as well, can I suggest that it's reworded to say that it will be the council's nominee and only the council even if um, another provider cannot be found. So reverse it, rather the council or nominee where we've got that flexibility, make it clear in our wording that we will explore all other opportunities ahead of ourselves, which I think is what's missing at the moment from from the words that have been cited to us. Mm -hmm. And I would hope would reassure um, that the, the residents that the council is taking the, the best steps it can to increase the rate of uh, perpetuity. Right, thank you. Mr. Reid. Um, uh, Chair, I, I am satisfied that we can tweak the agreement such that um, the, the council uses all reasonable endeavours to get a registered provider on board to take on any of the units which might otherwise go to the open market. And it's only if the council is unsuccessful in persuading a registered provider to, to come on board that it would then uh, uh, itself wish to exercise the, the the right to avoid any of the units going on to the open market. Uh, but I think it's also important to highlight 
that the charity are not overstretching themselves in relation to the uh, um, amount that they're seeking to borrow. I believe that's part of the information which has been put forward. And as I confirmed earlier, uh, unlike a situation of a registered provider where um, they would not they would be reluctant to accept wording the charity fully accept that if they only needed to, to, to sell two dwellings to pay back the mortgagee then only two dwellings would be sold the usual situation is the registered provider would want all of the dwellings sold irrespective so that's a, 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 to my mind a key additional safeguard that uh, places the, the the risk element in context. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, I have a few more speakers, I think. Councillor Hawkins was next, Chair. It's Councillor, right. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. I'm not going to prolong this. My comment was uh, going to be on the fact that we already had the safeguard that um, Mr. Reid read out to us, which is the uh, the council or its nominee, uh, will be the ones to uh, purchase the property, which gives that assurance. And frankly, I think we already have that. I'm happy for the clarification to be made in the document, but I think we need to move forward with this. It's the MIP that we're discussing, not anything else. And I hear what um, uh, what was said earlier by the member of the public um, on parking and some of the other issues, but it's the myth that is the point here and we need to focus on that and move on. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. And Councillor Roberts, Chair. Yeah, thank you very much. Councillor Roberts. Chairman, I'm very aware that it's almost 11 o'clock, so I will just say I think the concerns that I have have been answered. I would say, however, I think it's very important that we just don't not discuss these things and give everything carte blanche. It, it's it's a very good project, but we have to make sure. Thank you, Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, I, Chairman, I have made a proposal, but we haven't actually agreed if we're going to agree to that. You weren't satisfied with uh, the comments of the legal officer then? So, uh, Chairman, um, yes, I'll, 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 chair, I'll second Heather's um proposal but it's still discussing uh, hang, 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 hang on a minute uh i'm coming back to councillor williams can we be clear what you are now proposing which is anything different from what the officers have just said that are already doing what um just conscious of time what um stephen reed said was he'd be happy to change change the current wording to that which he said about giving the preference to the housing registered provider first what we haven't done is actually agree as a committee to give authority to Stephen Reid okay. to okay. make that change. So you, you're said. happy with the suggestion that Mr Reid has made? Yes. Uh, and we just simply want to confirm that. So that's been seconded, if I understand it, by Councillor Roberts, Chair? Yeah? Yes, Chairman, thank you. Right. Um, so are we all happy with that? Agreed. Is anyone Agreed. against? Can't hear any against. So that change of wording then is agreed. Now we need to come back to Councillor Fain's uh, motion. Um, Chairman, uh, it, it's sorry, Councillor, sorry. Hang, hang on a minute. So Councillor Fain's attempts to actually save some time clearly haven't worked. Um, but Chairman, before we do anything else. We've got 59 minutes and we're about to go um, to one minute silence. Um, Mr Carter, would you be no. kind enough to do the timing for us? Yes, I will. So, I'll, I'll let everyone know when two minutes has expired. OK, so we're um, just coming up to 11 o'clock now. So I'm suspending um, operations for the moment and it is now 11 o'clock and we will recognise two minutes silence. Thank you.
Chairman, thank you. That is two minutes silence completed. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you everybody. Uh, and we return to business. Um, I think we have now agreed the adjustment to the um, recommendations wording. Um, the, 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 technically, we should now go back to um, Councillor Fain's request to go to a vote, but that would require two votes. One to say that we're going to a vote, then doing the vote. I mean, are we ready simply to go to the vote? Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. OK, we, we're going to the vote then. So um, the recommendation is on uh, page 15, uh, item 32, with the adjusted wording as outlined by uh, Mr. Reid. Um, the recommendation is for approval. Uh, are we all in favour of that? Agreed. 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 Anybody Agreed. Against, against? Chairman, it's Councillor Nick Wright. I won't take part in the vote because I lost connection during the meeting, during yeah. a meltdown. So uh, I would, okay. can you put me down as not voted? Right, thank you very much for Chair, that. Chair, Chair, if I may. Yes, please, Mr. Reid. Um, so there's uh, two two amendments, Chair. One is to take out the reference to in perpetuity, and the second one is to uh, ensure that in the event that the charity were to go in default, the pref uh, the district council will, will use all reasonable endeavours to persuade a registered provider to take on the dwelling in advance of the district council doing so. Yes, OK, I, th I think we've actually agreed to that already. Yeah. You know, are you suggesting that I need to no. do another vote? Uh, sorry, Chair, I, the, the recommendation just on the page, just I think you do need to, to ask members to confirm that they agree the reference to in perpetuity comes out. OK. Agreed. Right, members, we all heard that, so we need to agree that with the word in per per perpetuity is removed. Can I take that by affirmation? Agreed. Agreed. And against? That council rights phone again. <laughs> OK, so we've done Not that. We now need to do the substantive vote then. And the substantive vote is for the recommendation at um, item uh, paragraph 32 on page 15 with those adjusted wording. Can I take this by affirmation, please? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Agreed. No one against. Uh, let's recognise that um, um, Councillor Wright, unfortunately, um, is not be able to vote in this one. So that is agreed then with those um, adjustments. Good, we move on then to item six, which is at Fulbourn. This is application 2002450 FUL. It's uh, Barnsbury House, Cox's Grove, Fulbourn. The proposal is for a change of use and conversion from C4 use to large house in multiple occupancy, uh, HMO. So we use HMO as the um, definition of house in multiple occupancy. The applicant is uh, Mr. Bird. Material considerations will be outlined by the presenting officer. The application is brought to the committee because it was called in by Fulham Parish Council and sub subsequently agreed at the delegation meeting held on the 22nd of September 2020. Presenting officer is Rebecca Claydon. Uh, Claydon, would you please give us your presentation? Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Sorry, 
read that with me. Can I just confirm that everyone can see the presentation, please? We can see that. Thank you. Lovely. Um, so the site is Barnsbury House, which is located on the east side of Cox's Drove. Um, I'll just move my pointer actually. So this is Barnsbury House here and you can see it here as well. The site does not fall within a conservation area. Um, the development framework does run through the site and cuts off a significant part of the main dwelling and all of the rear garden. Whilst a section of the rear garden is located within the green belt, the majority is not. Residential dwellings are located to the immediate south and west of the site. Um, this is an aerial image showing the location of Barnsbury House to the north of Fullbourne. You can just see it here and I've outlined the site in red. This application seeks permission for the change of use from C4 use, which is a small house in multiple occupation or HMO, to an eight person, eight bedroom, large HMO, which would fall under sui generis use class. No external changes are proposed. Officers are recommending approval of the application. So the dwelling is currently in use as a small HMO, which as I say, falls under use class C4. Use class C4 allows for the use of a dwelling as an HMO for up to six occupants. Under permitted development rights, dwellings are able to change between C3 residential use and C4 um, HMO use, with uh, allowing for the occupation of up to six residents without the need for planning permission. This proposal, proposal is for eight occupants, which would fall under sui generis use. So given the permitted development fallback in this application, officers have assessed the impact of the two additional residents beyond the permitted development fallback position of use class C4. So these are the proposed ground floor plans. There would be two bedrooms, bedroom one, which is located here, and bedroom six. Um, bedroom six would be located in the former annex. There would be two kitchens and a drawing living room on the ground floor, which opens out into the rear garden. The internal amenity space created by the communal rooms, as well as the provision of a large external amenity in the form of the large garden, is considered to be sufficient for eight occupants. And this is the proposed first floor plan where the remaining six bedrooms would be located. All eight bedrooms meet the residential space standards required for single occupancy. Condition two, as recommended, would ensure that the property is not occupied, occupied by more than eight persons. And this is the view of Barnsbury House, which is this building here, um, looking from Cox's Drove. And this is a view of the front elevation of the north of Barnsbury House. It's quite large, so I couldn't fit the whole um, dwelling into one picture. Um, Given that there are no external alterations proposed, it is considered that the proposal would not have a negative impact on the surrounding context, including impact to the green belt in terms of its design. Um, on this site location plan, the blue circles indicate the nearest um, neighbouring occupiers. As stated previously, this assessment assesses the impact of the two additional residents beyond the permitted development fallback position of six residents under use class C4. In terms of impact to neighbouring amenity, whilst there may be some impact to the residential amenity of the neighbouring occupiers in terms of increased comings and goings as a result of the two additional occupants, due to the small amount of additional occupiers and the sufficient amount of internal amenity space, as well as the physical distance between the dwellings. So they all have quite large curtilages, as you can see from this location plan. It is unlikely that the proposal is going to have a significant adverse impact to the neighbouring residents in terms of noise. In addition, given that there are no external alterations proposed, there would be no added impact in terms of overshadowing, overlooking or sense of enclosure resulting from the proposals. A supplementary plan was submitted by the applicant, which does aim to clarify the ownership of the garden, um, as this is what was not clear in the lo uh, location plan that was submitted with the application. Therefore, officers are recommending a new condition um, to ensure that there would be sufficient external amenity space. So the recommended additional condition would be worded as follows. 
Um, the area edged on the blue plan reference shall only be used and retained for residential use in association with the Alston multiple occupation. Um, and the reason for this is to ensure that the occupants of the HMO have sufficient access to private amenity space in accordance with policy HQ1 of the South Cambridgeshire Local Plan. Um, the key considerations of this application, therefore, are principle of development, neighbour amenity, impact of the character and appearance of the area and highway matters. Taking into account the points discussed, it is considered that the property is suitable for a large eight person HMO and that it would not result in significant adverse immunity issues to the neighbouring properties. Officers are therefore recommending approval of the application subject to conditions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, just for entire clarity, it'll be quite clear that there's a fallback position where they already have permission for six. Uh, so what we need to concentrate on is the effect of an additional two possible um, residents in this property. Could you confirm that, please? Um, yeah, yeah. So um, there is a permitted development fallback under C4 of six occupants. This is for eight occupants, so we're assessing the two extra um, additional occupants. OK, please. good. Thank you very much. So um, do I have speakers, please? Do I have well, not speaker? Any points of clarification? I've Council? put down chairman, it's Deb Roberts. Uh, I've been, OK, Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if, if the officer could just clarify for me in my mind, because I'm very unsure at this moment, and given previous comments from the local members, um, exactly what use uh, is this building going to be? Because we're not describing it as bed sits or flats. We're describing it as bedrooms um, and eight bedrooms, which is over the number allowed. Is it in fact a hostel? What is the actual use going to be of this? It, it seems to me we are giving very little, uh, I've been given very little background as to uh, what use will be made of it, by whom, um, but we're going to be asked, I'm sure, by the local members to consider past problems. Right, so could I have that clarified, please, Chairman? Yeah, let's clarify that and can we be clear whether this is a material matter, please? Um, so the use is sui generis use, so it falls under a unique classification. There isn't a particular use ca class for it. Um, it would be for eight people. The definition of an HMO is a property rented out by at least three people who are not from one household. So they're unrelated individuals, but share facilities such as the bathrooms, and kitchens and amenity areas. Um, so it does fall under an HMO and it falls under sui generis use class. Is, does that clarify it a bit more? Um, sorry, no. It, it really makes it even, um, I mean, I'm even more confused. I'm, I'm like going through a fog here. Um, is it or, or has, has, has a Is it a hostel? No, Councillor Roberts, let, let's, let's hear from Mr Carter. Here's Ms. Carter. Yes. Please. Yep. Sorry, Chair. Thank you. Um, yes, clarify that, and we just like uh, if we yeah. could have some guidance whether this is material. Please. So yes. So when a use falls into a sui generis use, that simply means that it doesn't fall within one of the other specified use classes. Uh, so what that means is that if something has a sui generis use, then if it were to change to something else, that would require planning permission. Um, but this is a house in multiple occupation um, that's a recognised uh, residential type uh, and as Rebecca has explained it would be for um, eight people only. Um, it, it wouldn't be a hostel, it would be a house in multiple occupation um, and um, that's really as far as I can explain it Chair I think. Okay, uh, we have thank Councillor you. Uh, is, is it a material planning issue, whether it's a hostel or whatever you're going to describe it, is the issue is that it's eight people in multiple occupancy, isn't it? Yes, Chair, they've applied for planning permission for a large HMO, not for a hostel. That would be a, a different use that would require okay. a separate planning permission if it were a hostel. Right, thanks. 
Thank you. Okay. Councillor Roberts, are you happy with it? No, but it won't get me anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Councillor Bradman, then, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I wanted to ask for clarification on two matters. Uh, one is that actually a lot of the concerns that have been raised um, are around use of cars and parking um, and the fact that in the past that has caused um, noise and traffic. And I just wanted to ask um, what provision has been or what assurances have been sought about uh, how many cars are intended to be parked there and is there a maximum on the number of cars uh, or car parking spaces? And also I wanted to ask clarification on, although this is eight bedrooms and I understand that the um, there is a condition to, the, to control no more than eight people live there, but in theory if those are double beds then it could be 16 people living there and I just wanted to clarify how that is controlled. OK, thank you. OK, officer, can you enlighten, please? Yeah, so um, regarding the first point around um, concerns about car parking and amount of car parking spaces, um, the Cam South Cambridgeshire Local Plan Policy TI3 doesn't actually state any car parking standards for HMO sui generous use, um, but the standard for C3 yes, residential use has a minimum of two spaces per dwelling. Um, whilst um, officers do consider this to be sufficient, um, a recommended condition has been attached to any permission um, that does require further details of vehicle parking um, in order um, to make sure that um, parking is satisfactory. Um, regarding the second point about the eight bedrooms, um, no, it couldn't be 16. Um, condition two does restrict it to um, eight persons. I believe it also is restricted under environmental health licensing for the HMO. Um, so definitely from a planning point of view, um, it would be restricted to only eight occupants. And we believe that the residential space standards meet um, it, uh, standards for the occupants for single occupancy bedrooms for eight people. So again, 16 people would not um, be allowed in this instance. And and my question was, how would that be uh, maintained? Um, so again, condition two does restrict that. So if they were to breach that condition, that would be then an enforcement matter. Um, I believe we can also impose a condition if needed regarding management, um, regarding management plan, if that would be something that um, would potentially be helpful for you. Um, but well, yes, again, yeah. Sorry, Chairman, with your um, permission, the reason I'm asking is that um, houses in multiple occupation sometimes accommodate people with different shift patterns. So it would actually very, be very hard for somebody to monitor how many people were living in it at any one time. Um, and I'm, that's why I asked how would this be monitored? Because it's not clear to me how you would how you would know how many people were living in it. Well, I think that's an impossible question, isn't it? We've already been told, I mean, we can only put the conditions on and there's an enforcement um, regime, um, which uh, I mean, we're not under control of. Um, OK, I'm going to move on. Um, Councillor Thane, do you have further speakers, please? I think Councillor Hawkins wanted to speak, Chair. Well, was Councillor Williams also on the list? Uh, I don't see Councillor yes, Williams. I Toby Williams asked I am, to speak. I am, I am down to speak. And I am also. I'm. I'm after Toby. Um, right. I thought Toby had retracted his. Um, yeah. Toby yeah. retracted. Then it's me. Then Chris Carter. Okay. Then to me. Right. Councillor Heather Williams. Then please. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted clarification from officers that we can see from the consultation responses that we're being asked to put. Um, material planning consideration towards the experience when this was previously to do with noise and so I'd like officers advice as to whether the previous experiences is something that we can take as a material planning consideration. Thank you chairman. 
Thank you. I think Mr. Carter is going to tell us about that. Thank you, Chair. Um, we need to consider the merits of the application in, in front of us. You won't be surprised to hear me, hear me say, uh, rather than in any uh, historic uh, management issues that may have occurred at the property. So uh, that would be my advice, um, just to consider the, the matter in front of you rather than um, the history. Uh, as Rebecca has said, um, if, uh, if enforcement issues were to arise around the way in which the property is being used or the number of occupants, then that would be a matter for separate enforcement investigation at that time. Thank you, Chair. Right, thank you. And I have uh, Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think um, some of the uh, issues I was going to talk about have been clarified, but in terms of concerns about, uh, you know, its use and noise, and how that will be enforced, that will be enforced under the HMO license. It is a licensed HMO, it has been given a license and um, management is an issue that comes under that and there are hefty fines for HMO landlords who uh, do not keep their um, tenants in check. Uh, so, thank you. All right, there's no question there. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have uh, Councillor Bradnam wants to speak again, Chair. Again, are you thank sure you. you want to speak again? Of course I'm sure, Chairman, thank you. Not the same question then, please. No, but I would like to pick up on a point that um, Chris Carter advised us about, that, um, or, or, or perhaps indeed uh, Miss Clayton, that if we were concerned about um, the management of the development, that we could seek a management plan and I would if if and I'm not saying they do but if the committee is minded to approve this I would like that we require a condition that a management plan is included. Not quite sure what you mean by a management plan. Well I refer you to Miss Clayton or Chris Carter then because I was asking about how would you be able to check that there were indeed only eight people living there and we were referred to a management plan. So I would uh, like, that's okay, why I'm seeking clarification. Mr Carter, would you clarify that for us, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think there's there's two issues to discuss here. One uh, is the point made by Councillor Hawkins, which is that uh, the HMO uh, requires a licence under environmental health legislation, which I understand it already has, uh, and that requires certain management uh, procedures to be um, acted upon taking place. Uh, I think what Rebecca was saying was that um, if the committee was so minded, uh, a condition could be added which would require the submission of a management plan for the agreement of the local planning authority. Um, I would suggest such a plan could potentially include um, the owner of the property keeping record of the number of occupants um, and submitting that to the council periodically in a redacted form. Um, but uh, that may well be duplication of, of the requirements under the uh, HMO licence. Um, right. So the committee may not consider that's necessary, but that is an option that's open to you. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you very much. Councillor Khan was next. Uh, Councillor Khan, please. The main issue that seems to me to be important here is the, the access to the property along the private drive. Uh, it's extremely narrow. Uh, the highways commented on the issue of the public highway, but this is a private highway. Can we have any uh, control of the management of that? Uh, would there be, for instance, a passing, providing a passing area on the actual drive make a difference? Um, how much of an issue can we take into account the, uh, the actual access on the drive itself uh, in view of the highways comments? Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Clayton. Can you help there, please? Uh, yeah, so we do have um, some recommended conditions regarding highways access. Um, it's potentially not in the applicant's control, though, um, regarding sort of passing places and things like that. Um, the highway is potentially not in the applicant's control, so potentially no, we can't necessarily consider it. Um, Toby, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Uh, 
Thanks, Chair. Yes, I'm, I'm a bit, uh, um, uh, through you, Chair, a, a bit worried about that suggestion of a passing place because if the... Uh, hang, on, hang on, Toby. Nobody knows who you are yet. Perhaps you just <laughs> like to introduce yourself first. Apologies, I'm I'm the area development manager for Team Two. I'm I'm Rebecca's um, manager. Um, apologies, Chair. Um, I I think we would have to look into that in in a bit more detail. It might be something that the applicants could clarify when they come to speak. But I'm I'm a little bit hesitant to say it's something that could be achievable because. I'm not sure whether they, for example, would have um, a right to carry out works to um, introduce a passing place on that bit of the driveway that extends from the public highway, which is kind of private, private after that point to the actual house in question. But it, it may be something that could be put to the um, or be clarified by the uh, by the applicant. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Chair, I'm not sure whether Councillor Hawkins wanted to speak again or not. She's next on the list. Right. Uh, no, regret. It's been sorted. Thank you. Thank you very much. I yeah. think Councillor Williams, Heather Williams, was a technical point. Councillor Richard Williams, I think, is next to speak. OK, Councillor Heather Williams, you want to come back? I think Chair, we my my point was just to say if we're worried about duplication, do we have an environmental health officer that could uh, present and like we had with the housing to explain if there would be duplication for a management plan or not? Well, I think we have to make our, you know, we've been through quite a lot of this and I think the, the answer is pretty clear that you know it, the license is the license and it, it is in part a management plan. But and Chairman do... Councillor Bradenham was asking for, for it to be included, there's been a concern raised about duplication. If we had an EHO officer, would be able to learn for us if it was duplication or not? And Mr that Carter's means... going to help us on. Thank you, Chair. Um, we don't have an EHO present, Councillor Williams. Um, I think that uh, my advice would be that the condition restricting the number of occupants is sufficient for planning purposes. I don't believe that we need a management plan on top of that um, and that the other matters in terms of the day-to-day uh, -day management of the premises uh, will be picked up under the Environmental Health Licence. Um, if issues arose with the number of occupants, I believe that the planning authority would have the ability to act under the terms of the condition restricting the number of occupants, and I believe that that would be sufficient. Thank you, Chair. Right, thank you very much. I think that's Councillor quite... Richard Williams, then. Yeah, Councillor Richard Williams, please. Right, thank you, Chair. Um, can, can I just go back to Mr Carter on, on the point about material planning considerations? And I, I, I'm sort of anticipating something I think the ward councillors are going to say and the parish council may say because they've, they've said it in written form but just about this this issue of the previous experience and the fears of residents not being a, a material consideration because I would have thought it was I mean it it does relate to a planning purpose it does have a connection with the proposed land um, and, and there are instances where you know fears of local residents and, and, and past experience has been accepted as a as a material consideration so I was wondering if you could just Say a little bit more on his thinking as to why it wouldn't be the case here. OK, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I think we would need to be able to um, demonstrate how that relates to this proposal. So um, I, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with the previous issues that may or may not have um, occurred at the site. I don't know if the, the team leader, Toby Williams, uh, could shed any further light on that. But I, I think they could only be considered um, relevant if we were able to demonstrate that we, we thought that was likely to arise again through through this proposal um, and I'm not uh, from my experience of this site I'm not aware that that would be the case but I'm happy to take advice from the case officer or team leader who may know a little more about that councillor. Toby is there anything you would add to that? Yeah my um, my understanding is that the previous use was um, that caused a lot of concern was much more of a kind of short term visitor type use with the property being put on an um, external website like booking.com where there was much more um, movement of people on a short term basis coming 
uh, to and from the um, property. And um, that is a different type of use to the use that's being proposed today in the local planning authority would retain um, control through its enforcement powers if if the property were used um, for those uh, for those purposes, which is much more of a kind of visitor accommodation um, use. So I, I don't think that those impacts previously are directly relevant to the application that's before members uh, members today. OK, thank you very much for that. Um, we do have public speakers, so I'd like to move on to them, please. Um, then I have Mr John Mason. Mr Mason, are you with us, please? I understand you're yeah, for yeah. the applicant. Yeah. Yes, good morning. Um, if you can all hear, uh, see and hear me. Yeah, we can all do that. So you've got your three minutes. Uh, so when you're ready. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, good morning, Chair and Councillors. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the applicant. And um, thank you as well to the case officer, Rebecca Clayton, for her help in uh, managing the application. Um, so the site comprises a detached um, house um, just on the border of the settlement boundary of Fullbourne. It's a large house within a large curtilage. An application to separate the house and its annex into two dwellings was dismissed at appeal in 2015. Following that, it was converted to two separate holiday lets around 2016. At this time, the issues referred to by ward councillors and the parish councillor arose regarding possible issues of antisocial behaviour. An enforcement officer visited the site and advised that the use of their annex as a separate holiday let was considered to be in breach of planning control, and ad as a result, the holiday use ceased. In October 2018, the dwelling was converted to a small house in multiple occupation, um, which enables the conversion of dwellings to small HMOs. Um, the site is currently in use as an HMO for five people, and it has an environmental health license to that effect, which limits it at five. Um, although the permitted development rights do allow it for use up to six. Um, while it's been in this most recent use, there have been no complaints or issues with the neighbours or the parish council that the applicant is aware of. Uh, the applicant and their tenants have maintained cordial relations with the neighbours, and it is important to note that this application has not received any objections from residents of other dwellings on Cox's Close. Um, following the objection from the Parish Council, in September, the applicant obtained letters from current tenants to evidence how the HMO is currently used. These were sent to the Parish Council to demonstrate that there was no cause for concern with the future use of the site. While it's not a material planning consideration, it demonstrates that the existing tenants primarily comprise young professionals working either in Cambridge or in the business parks within South Cambridgeshire. There are no issues of noise and organising large parties or having guests for extended periods would be in breach of their tenancy agreements. And so I hope that provides some background to um, the previous uses of the site and how this current use is different. Um, just to come back on the access point, um, the access isn't particularly narrow except for the very last stretch, um, as there are large grass verges along most of it, um, and there is at least one passing place as well. And um, so I hope that serves to clarify some of the matters that have been raised so far. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, members, at any points of clarification? Anyone would like to pursue with Mr. Mason? No, I can't see any. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Mason, for that contribution. Sorry, Chairman, it oh. takes a while to type in. I just wanted to ask Mr. Mason, in the um, Google imagery, there is a car parked in the parking place, and I wanted to ask him in his experience of this location, is there often a car parked in that passing place? Mr. Mason? Yes, um, I don't believe so, no. All right, thank you very much. Okay, I don't have any other speakers for you, Mr. Mason, so we'll, we'll uh, move on. Yeah, Councillor Hawkins. That's right, yeah. Councillor Hawkins, please, yeah. Uh, just to ask Mr. Mason, uh, in his view, how many cars can be parked in the curtilage of the property? Mr. Mason, can you help us with that, please? Um, so at the moment, we have space for four cars, and then the application seeks to increase that to six, um, and a parking plan was provided, but I believe there's going to be a condition attached to it as well. Um, so we are applying for six parking spaces, um, but then there is a large cycle store in the back as well with space for at least eight cycles. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I have no other clarifications, Chair. I just check. Are we still on? Oh, yeah, so, sorry. It's all gone very quiet. Sorry, I, I was I was mu muted. Um, so I was, apologies for that. I was just saying that we don't have any representatives from the parish council who have chosen not to uh, come today, but we have local members who are Councillor John Williams and Councillor Claire Dalton. I think Councillor Williams is going to speak first. Uh, Councillor Williams, you. Have your three thank, minutes. Thank you. Th thank you, Chair. Um, the officer's report makes no reference to the Village Design Guide supplementary planning document adopted in January 2020 or the emerging neighbourhood plan for Fulbourn. This is an important omission. The location of this application, which is within the soft edge of the village, is recognised in both documents as an area of sensitivity, bordering as it does Fulbourn Fen. Moreover, no mention is made of additional light or noise pollution, both of which were prominent in the history of this property. They impacted on surrounding dwellings, as evidence shows in actions by this council against the owner over four years and would be an important consideration given this location. As to the full born VDG SPD, this application concerns a property which is within the poor well area specifically identified by the guide. I quote from the guide about the Paul Well area. This is a unique highlight in Fulbourn and is partly in the conservation area. It has links to the heritage of water management and Finland agriculture and brings nature directly into the village. The tall trees and green aspect of Cow Lane at this location provide a memorable image of the village within trees. In my opinion, this application should be refused on the grounds that it fails to respect, retain or enhance the local character as identified in the village design guide. Its impacts will compromise the countryside frontage with Fulbourn Fen through inappropriate increased traffic movements, parking, noise and lighting. In particular, no assessment has been made on the impact on wildlife, particularly the impact of more human activity on bats which are known from other recent planning applications to be very active in the area. Members of the planning committee, I hope you too will respect the full board design as a supplementary planning document and we feel thank you for allowing me to speak. Right, thank you very much, Councillor Williams. Uh, any points of clarification? Councillor Thane, I think you want to pursue something. Councillor Fanning. Councillor Hawkins was first. All right, Councillor Hawkins then please. Uh, thank you Chair. Uh, Councillor Williams, thank you for your comments. Um, I'm not clear really how the use of this property as an HMO is contrary to the village design guide because it's already in existence, it's already been used. Um, even if it were a single house uh, or a single family house, you could still have, you know, I don't know, four or five kids living at home with their own cars. So how does it, how is it contrary to the VDG? Thank you. Well, can I answer that? First of all, yes. the officer has made no reference to the SPD. So obviously she has not taken it into account in her um, in her um, reasoning or her um, decision on 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 this application because she makes no reference to it in the application in her report at all. Okay. Um, secondly, that the additional traffic and it is clear from what the representative of the applicant has said that there are insufficient parking spaces if you are going to have eight people there, there are only six parking spaces, there is no parking available elsewhere along that lane 
for other people. So they will end up parking in the conservation area in on the public highway. Uh, so that will have an effect on the conservation area. And I'm surprised again that that has not been mentioned in the officer's report. And the officer's report has not mentioned the fact that there will be additional light pollution. There will be more people living there. So therefore there will be more lights on in that building. And again, this building is in a sensitive location on the soft, soft edge of the village boundary. So therefore I find it incredible that the officer has not referred to the village design statement. It is a, you know, it is a supplementary planning document. It should be taken into account in this application and it hasn't been. And I therefore would ask members not to accept this application. All right, thank you very much. Chair, we have a number of others seeking clarification. Councillor Heather Williams, Councillor Anna Bradnam, Councillor Richard Williams. And I note that uh, the case officer would like to speak perhaps in response to what's just been said. Uh, um, we'll, do, we'll do that later. This is for public speaking and clarification of the um, public speaking points. So the next person then is Councillor Heather Williams then, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Williams, may I say this is a record, the most Williams is in a, a meeting, we've got Toby as well. But um, <laughs> so, so you referenced about the increased impact for, for nature and, and wildlife and light and noise. Um, but what as a committee we're being asked is to extend it from six people to eight people. So could you could you try and um, give me some clarity around the the extension of those two people that you think is going to have the most impact, not not the site as a whole, because we're only looking at the extra two. I, I know, um, with the exception of parking, I take your point on the parking. Thank sure, you. Sure, surely, councillor, it is for the officer and the applicant to explain what impacts that is going to have on the property. It has not been studied. There has been no study undertaken into the possibility of noise and lighting impact as a result of this. So we don't know, do we? Because it's not been it's not been studied. It should have been studied. And given the fact that this is a sensitive area under the um, under the village design guide, that should have been a requirement of this application. They have not been asked to do it. It is okay. an omission which has an important bearing on this application. I'm not I'm not an expert. I can't tell you what light and noise impacts there would be. All right, Council. I would expect there to have been point. a study uh, done into it. We, I will bring so, the case officer back in at the end of this element. So Chairman, can I come so back, uh, Council Williams? Thank you. So so from my clarification, what you're saying is you believe that there will potentially be an in, not that there will be an impact of the increase of two people, there will potentially and so your your issue is that it hasn't been looked at as opposed to you believing that it does have an impact. Is that absolutely, 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 Heather? Yeah. OK, so you, we're not sure what the impact is. That's your issue. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Councillor Bradman. Brad, yeah, Councillor Bradman, then, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I wanted to just check with Councillor Williams. Um, I'm fairly familiar with Fullbourne, but I just want to check that the Fullbourne Fen is actually on the west side of Cox's Drove, so it's at some distance. No, it's to the north. It's to the north of Cox's Drove. Um, Fullbourne Fen actually comes across the railway into the north of Cox's Drove. That is all referred to as Fullbourne Fen. Okay, right, and. Um, I'd refer you to the uh, public inquiry into land east of Tevisham Road, which identified that as Fullbourne Fen. OK, thank you, because um, on certainly on Google Maps, it looks as if the land to the north is being fairly moderately farmed. It appears to have grazing on it. And I just wanted to check where where the the impact of where, where, where the where Fullbourne Fen was. OK. Thank you for okay. that. All right. Thank you very much. And Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and, and thank you, thank you, um, um, Councillor Williams, um, for, for, for your um, submission earlier. Can I just ask you um, 
uh, to say a little bit more about the, the past problems um, that have been um, encountered in the house when it was used to house immigrant workers, I think you said in your written submission. Yeah. Um, my, my thinking here is that th these things could be a material consideration if fears about the future can be reasonably extrapolated from events in the past. Because that, that could be a material consideration. So, so that, that's where I'm going. That, that's what I'm thinking about the, here. The, the, the biggest difficulty in the past was the parking issue. Um, the, what, what you didn't really see from the photograph or the plan is that it is extremely difficult to turn around in that area. Um, and at the time, they had upwards of a dozen people living in that house um, at short terms, at all times of the day. Many, many of them were people who were working at, as Councillor Bradnam has said, at odd hours of the day and night. There was coming and going from early in the morning, from 4 a.m. to gone midnight. Um, and the parking was such that people were parking along Cox's Drove because they couldn't get parking uh, in the curtilage of that property. One of the reasons for that was it's extremely difficult to reverse or, or turn round within that car, car, curtilage while there is other while there are other vehicles parked there. But it was really um, upsetting for the local residents. In one resident in particular um, who lived adjacent, who has since moved, the family actually ended up moving because it took us four years to bring an enforcement notice against the owner of this property. He was very good. He employed some very good planning lawyers and he managed to basically turn, tie us up in knots for years over trying to get this sorted out. Um, and I fear that I hear what you say about licensing, but all of this can, enforcement can only happen if we can have legal grounds in which to enforce. And I know from previous experience with this property and with the owner of this property that we will have extreme difficulty in making any enforcement of any license going forward. And it does concern me that um, given the uh, behaviour in the past, that I have no confidence that we will be able to control this situation. But I go back to my uh, thank, thank you. I, I think this yeah, is my objection. Is, Williams, I think we've got it, the point. It's the village design statement and the fact that we have ignored it. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, just before we move on, there's there's background noise and there is uh, Barbara Kettle. Could you please mute Barbara Kettle? Which, Sorry, which, I thought it was muted. Beg your pardon. No, you're not. Thank you. OK, sorry. So, um, Councillor Thane, any more? Uh, Councillor Bradnam um, and then the case officer, I think, Chair. Councillor Bradnam again. Thank yes. you, Chairman. Um, I just want to clarify, again, referring to Google Maps, I note that to the north of this property, in other words, in the field to the north, there is a farm track, there is a quite a wide track and it appears on Google imagery from 2020 that there's some attempt to make access into that northern part of the site. Is it your understanding that that is their attempt to try and make parking, to, to provide the parking that they, they're seeking to achieve? Is, is that your understanding of what's happening they, there? They made an attempt to, um, without planning permission, to further develop that site. They built that road on, on Greenbelt uh, without planning consent and it was stopped by us eventually after a lot of money, a lot of our, our officers time to prevent that happening. And I think that just demonstrates who you're dealing with here. So is it your impression that- yeah, I think we need to be a little bit careful on Okay. I mean, I don't see that it's actually relevant to this actual application anyway. Well, okay. it does. It, it I'm not going I, into a debate about it. No, here. sorry, Chairman. Councillor Deborah Robinson. Sorry, what I wanted to check was, can we seek in the debate, can we seek clarification from the case officer about how we're going to get confirmation about how the parking will be achieved? I'm sure we can, certainly. Thank you. Okay. Um, sorry, Councillor Thane, 
Councillor Deborah Roberts was okay. next with the question, okay. and then Councillor Martin Cohen. All right, Councillor Roberts, please. Many thanks, Chairman. Can I just ask the officer to confirm, um, or maybe the local member, sorry, are we talking about that the previous problems, the owner then, is it the same owner who is now putting this application in? I understand it is. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, John Williams. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Khan, please. And then I'm going to the case officer to comment. Councillor Khan, please. So it, it's a question basically both for the case officer and for Councillor John Williams. Um, Williams at the moment, please. So fine. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, currently, you've got a, a permission for six, uh, has your multiple application for six uh, people. Uh, and uh, five, uh, four parking space. Uh, there are four park, uh, four parking spaces. Uh, so in fact, there's only five sorry people. So there's a shortfall of one space. If this uh, development took place, there will be uh, spaces for six people and uh, eight people living there. So there'll be a shortage for two space. It's therefore useful to know whether there is a problem at present and whether you think an additional one surplus car which could possibly arise would cause problems and could be co um, catered for i think we have to it's not just parking is it you know if you have more people living there you're going to have more deliveries you know we have a problem with uh, you've seen you've seen the width of the road it's very unsuitable for anything uh, other other than a car um you have deliveries going up there in quite large vehicles they end up having to reverse back down the road because they can't turn around within the curtilage of the there's no turning circle there. Um, yes, you're, you're quite right. At the moment, there doesn't appear to be a problem with parking, but that's because there are sufficient parking spaces. Um, what we're what um, we're asking is that we should um, give approval to um, not give everyone there a parking space. And um, I think, you know, I think we have to accept, given its location, even within the village, that people will have cars. And the only place for those people who don't have parking spaces to park is on the public highway in the conservation area. And um, unfortunately, you, you weren't given pictures of actually the area beyond the pri private drive and down to Cox's Drove. It's extremely difficult to park along there. It will cause, um, uh, you know, problems with with uh, access to the industrial estate along there, um, and therefore, you know, it will have an. It, it, parking is an issue, but in addition to parking, there is also the issue of deliveries. And the more people that live there, the more deliveries you're going to have. The more HG HCVs and large vans you're going to have using that uh, private drive, which is not suitable for vehicles of that size. Uh, uh, right, this is, can I, can I no. develop on this? Well, uh, I, it, I think we, we've laboured that point yeah. somewhat. Well, I was uh, just going to ask why uh, there haven't been complaints from neighbours. Well, one of the, well, the property that's near is Swallowfield. It's been empty for a good while, actually, because I say the previous owners ended up moving out. They got driven out by the by, by the issue. Um, so, yeah, so it, and it's not been and it's to be honest with you, it's not I don't I believe it's not been fully occupied anyway. OK, thank you very much for that. Did you have a, a question for the case officer? How's the car? Yeah, 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 sorry, yes, I did. I mean, I, the question was simply whether we could consider ownership as a matter, a planning, material planning matter. I felt that it, I thought it okay, wasn't. Okay, Mr. <laughs> Reid is actually going to help us with that. Mr. Reid? Um, yes, I was going to ask uh, uh, Councillor John Williams whether he accepts that ownership is not a material planning consideration. Yes, I do. Which is why I'm not making my my objection. My objection to this is not based on the ownership of the property. No, Councillor uh, John Williams, thank you for that. It was the 
Councillor Roberts seemed to to by her question um, give the ownership a, as a material consideration and I just wanted for you to confirm that you accepted ownership is not a material consideration so thank you for that confirmation. Mm -hmm. And I take it Mr Reid that you are confirming to us that it is not a material consideration it's not for Councillor Williams to tell us. Um, you can tell us what it's it was, question, Mr. Reid. Uh, I, I, I think it's a question for a planner, but certainly from my legal perspective, ownership is not a material consideration in relation to this application. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, case officer, could you address some of these points, please? Yeah, well, I'll do my best to uh, address all the points raised. Um, Thank you very much. First of all, I think regarding the um, village design guide and, and neighbourhood plan, this wasn't something that was initially raised by the parish council or um, ward councillors in their objection. However, um, given that there are no external changes to the property itself, we do believe that um, the neighbourhood the neighbourhood plan and village design guide would not be as relevant um, as it would be if there were external changes. Um, we are assessing the extra two occupants of the um, dwelling an assessment by officers is that there is no evidence of additional impact in terms of noise and light arising from um, the additional two occupants compared to the fallback of um, six people or even indeed a large family use of the property. Um, regarding sort of the previous um, previous issues, as stated earlier, um, that the use then was under short term that so it wasn't the same use as is being applied for now. Um, again, I think 12 occupants was raised. This is an application for eight occupants, six occupants. It's already allowed under permitted development. So again, it's the additional impact of those two occupants. We believe it wouldn't lead to um, particular issues with parking. Um, we as stated, we do have a parking condition around condition six, um, which asks for um, illustration of turning circles for those six parking spaces, which would then have to be approved by the local authority. Um, the local plan itself doesn't have any standards regarding HMO parking. Um, under policy TI3 there is no mention of HMO parking so officers believe that six parking spaces would be sufficient um, for the eight occupants. Um, considering the lack of policy around it there is no technical shortfall of um, parking because again it doesn't reference this in in the in the local plan. Um, I, th I think that redress addresses everything that was raised please do let me know if it doesn't. No, that's fine. OK, thank you very much. Um, so can I just clarify if the second um, local member is actually with us and wishes to speak? I do have Councillor Daunton on my list. Is Councillor Daunton with us? No. Chairman, yeah, you also yeah. have a further clarification request from Councillor Bradnam. Well, I'm pursuing this at the moment. Thank you. Uh, Councillor John Williams, do you know if Councillor Daunton was going to speak? I didn't believe she was coming today. I, I, I am surprised. All right. No, OK. No, thank you very much. Then. Um, and a final point of clarification from uh, Councillor Bradnam, and then we really must get on. We've spent more than an hour on this already. Thank you Councillor very much. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. I just wanted to ask, given that we have condition six, if the um, applicant is not able to demonstrate that there is any way of fitting six car parking spaces within the curtilage, um, what happens then? Um, well, it's a condition. If you don't meet the conditions, it doesn't proceed, does it? So, so if, if just suppose this was approved and they were not able to meet that condition. All right, let, let's get clarification be... from somebody who might know then. Let's uh, speak to Mr Carter. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, the requirements of the condition are to provide the information and have it approved by the Council uh, in writing before the use uh, commences. Uh, and so if they're not able to satisfy that condition, then the use cannot commence. Um, one word of caution, of course, that um, uh, they could uh, seek to appeal uh, against the condition itself uh, to change the wording um, if they chose to do so. But uh, on its face, it would restrict uh, the ability to implement the permission uh, if they were unable to demonstrate that. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that. OK, so we've done clarification. We're now on the debate. Should there be any? Does anybody wish to speak to the uh, proposal? Councillor Thane. Do we have any speakers? No, uh, yes, we now have Councillor Toomey Hawkins would like to speak. All right, good. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think what, you know, we have a situation where we're being asked to consider a use over and above the uh, permitted six. And as I see, the building already exists. It's already been used. And whilst I take the point about its previous use, that is now no longer the case. What is happening here is they're trying to regularize the use of the building, which already exists. So the question we need to answer is, will the use of additional two people cause any harm? And as I see, it, it's not been shown that there will be harm uh, caused to neighbors. Um, I see no objections. And I don't know why <laughs> there are no objections to what is being used currently, which indicates to me that, um, you know, the the proposal should be um, supported. Now, the, the issue about management, yes, the landlord is supposed to be managing all the agent, managing and responsible for um, the occupants uh, using the property, the phrase is in a tenant like manner. And if they do not, there are ways and means in which the landlord can deal with the issue. And that is not the material consideration. That is an HMO license consideration. And, and I speak from experience. So uh, unless we can show that the additional two people will cause significant harm, I don't see that we have any reason to refuse this. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you very much. We have some more speakers, do we, Councillor Thane? Uh, yes, we have Councillor Martin Khan, then Councillor Judith Ripith, and then I'll be putting in an application to speak myself. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Councillor Khan, then please. Yeah, I went out to make a site visit actually to the access to this because I was worried about it. Um, it is a, a narrow, a very narrow access. Um, more than just the top bit that you saw, um, but uh, um, but uh, it is in fact, uh, I was impressed that the fact there seemed to be space, there didn't seem to be a problem. What really impresses me, as I uh, agree with what Councillor Jimmy Hawkins has said, the, the issues related to planning, uh, are, uh, the fact that the building is there means that I don't think the uh, any real design or development issue really can be concerned. The real problem is the, whether there's too much disturbance from the increased usage. Uh, it seems to me that there is, going to, with the permission done, there will be a shortfall of two vehicles and parking spaces. At present, this shortfall of one doesn't seem to cause any problems. Um, the local neighbours have not objected, and I take that very seriously. We've got, you've got four, four actually built uh, properties, uh, other properties on that narrow drive. Uh, Clearly, one is not occupied. So there are the three other properties, and not one of them has actually objected. So they, it can't be causing a, new, a sufficient nuisance at present for them to want to object. Uh, and therefore, I don't really see any planning grounds on which to refuse it. Um, however much the parish council may feel unhappy about it, I, I don't really see any real planning grounds, and I think it should be supported. All right. Thank you very much. Councillor uh, Judith Ribbett. Yeah. yeah, I feel like we've been through this with a fine tooth comb from everything that's been said and all the clarifications. And I was going to propose that we move it to a vote. 
Thank you very much. There's just one more speaker, so we'll let Councillor Thane. Um, Thank you, Chair. I will use the opportunity to uh, second Councillor Riffith's motion. OK, thank you very much. So the uh, motion is to go to the vote and the vote is on the recommendation, which is for approval, bearing in mind what we're talking about is the change simply of the HMO, the House of Multiple Occupancy Arrangements. So those who are there, any, is there anybody wishing to vote against this? I can't hear anything, I see nothing in the chat. So can I take this as approval by affirmation? Agreed. 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 Right. Thank you very much for that. Agreed. It is therefore approved unanimously. Um, We've been going over two hours now, so I suggest we have a 10 minute break and come back at 12.20, please. So, um, Aaron, if you could close down the operation for 10 minutes, please. You can't hear me. I can hear you now. Yeah. Oh. You can't hear me, lovely. Okay, done.
Thank you very much, Chair. We are now live again. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome back to South Cam's District Council Planning Committee. We're on agenda item seven, that's page 27 of the agenda. Um, and we're dealing with planning application S3387 stroke 19 stroke RM. It's land rear of Strawberry Farm, Pampas of Road, Great Abington. The proposal is uh, approval of matters reserved for appearance, landscaping, layout and scale following outline planning permission S1433 stroke 16 stroke OL. A residential development comprising eight dwellings, including affordable housing provision, landscaping and associated infrastructure. The applicant is Shelford Properties Limited. Uh, key material considerations will be detailed by the presenting officer. Uh, this is a departure uh, and the application is brought to committee. Um, I need to correct the what is said here. What it actually says here, it's brought to the committee because the planning committee refused the previous reserve matters application on the 22nd of May. That's uh, S121319RM. Councillor Bachelor has therefore referred this back to the planning committee. No, Councillor Bachelor has not referred this back. The delegation meeting has uh, referred this back. Uh, just to be clear on that, the officer recommendation is for approval. The presenting officer is Michael Sextant. Mr. Sextant, could you give your presentation, please? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Apologies for the slight error on the recommendation there. I sorry, I should just caveat this. I've currently got my three year old with me. He should only be here for about 10 minutes. So apologies for any background shouting that may come across. I just hear my presentation. Chair, if you could confirm that a presentation is now on screen, please. I can see that, yes. Excellent. Yes, so this is yes a reserve matters application for appearance, landscaping, layout and scale following outline planning permission for a residential development comprising eight dwellings, including affordable housing, landscaping, associated infrastructure. This has been before committee in May 2020, but that, that was a separate reserve matters application, but a lot of the elements are identical. So this is the site location plan. Uh, we are on the southern edge of Great Abington Village uh, outside of the framework, but you'll know that the framework boundary abuts the northern boundary um, and outline consent was established at a time when the council didn't have a five year land supply. This is the site layout plan. We've flipped 180, so north is now uh, at the bottom, towards the bottom of the plan. You have plots one and two and plot eight are the three affordable units that are put forward as part of this application and then three uh, five detached market properties. The layout is very similar to the scheme that the committee saw previously, apart from some minor alterations to footprint where design has been updated, which we will come on to. Uh, just to give members uh, a flavour of the plots, we all of the plots are now one and a half storey property. So this is plots one and two. Uh, plot three, plot four, so you can kind of see a, a common theme of dormer windows being used now throughout the development. Um, plot six, plot seven, and plot eight. Apologies for whipping through those fairly quickly. Um, in terms of the context of the area, the uh, street view to the north at the top of this um, slide is the existing property number three, Pamisford Road, with the application site behind. And the uh, plan, the street view to the bottom is directly opposite the site where you've got the single storey properties along Pampersford Road. To the northwest of the application site, you've got a fairly recent hill development that has been built out in Great Abington, where you can see at the junction of High Street and Pampersford Road, you've got these fairly sizable two storey properties before heading down the High Street, uh, as shown on the bottom image with the hill development on the left, and then two storey properties on the right hand side as ground levels will fall slightly as you head into the village. 
It's worth noting that the application site is within the neighbourhood plan and the officer report clearly sets out how uh, or if the neighbourhood plan policies are applicable to this development. It's important to note that the outline consent was established before the neighbourhood plan was adopted um, and that that's clearly set out in the officer report. Uh, in terms of the, the style and character of the neighbourhood plan, um, it, again, it's important to note that the properties within the, the Land Assessment Association or the neighbourhood plan are predominantly, again, one and a half storey properties. And this is a view of, of North Road within the LSA estate uh, with some typical properties at the bottom. So you can see how the application is now really replicating that that form. So it is responsive in that context to the neighbourhood plan area. Shh, sorry, Luke. This was the previous reason for refusal of the last reserves matters application. I've added some emphasis where the uh, development was refused because of the, the scale, height and design of the properties being out of keeping with the character of the area um, and the dwellings of a sort of being a fairly substantial scale and how they respond in the wider landscape and the topography of the site, which sorry, I should have mentioned earlier, the site does rise as set out in the officer report, probably about five metres from the front of the site to the back of the site. Many, as I said, the details between the two reserve matters are essentially the same, except for the design of the buildings themselves. So this is just to show members how the design has responded to that previous reason for refusal. You have at the top here, plot three as original, um, and then plot three as amended as part of the current application. Um, apologies, my, hang on. I'm very sorry, my son needs to go to the toilet. Um, Bev, I will be back in one second, sorry. Right, uh, well, such is life. The um, joys of small children, Chairman. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Sorry, his nursery is right, Michael. COVID, so. Well done, Michael. Um, okay. Yes, so I'll try and finish this well. while he's doing what he needs to do, and then I will. Uh, so, yes, at the top, original and at the bottom, proposed. So, you can see how it's really looking now at a more one and a half story dwelling, a reduced ridge height, and using that that use of dormers, which is very characteristic of the, the area and very responsive to the. Uh, the layout and topography of the site. Same here, plot four at the top as originally submitted and previously refused. A fairly substantial two storey property is now being reduced to a much more sort of rural character, one and a half storey again with the dormer windows. And plot six, um, again, as an example, fairly sizable reduction of 1.2 metres lower in terms of ridge height and the more prominent use of dormer windows to convey that, that style again. So it is uh, obviously a reserve mass application in its own right, but I think it's worth highlighting that the only reason for refusal on the, the other reserve mass application was scale, which is why I've particularly highlighted scale here. But obviously the key materials considerations as set out in the officer report are compliance with the outline planning permission, uh, affordable housing, open space revision, then the reserve matters of, of layout, scale, appearance and landscaping, um, biodiversity, flood risk, highway safety and residential community. But I think the key consideration really is, is scale because the details are, are, aside from that, almost identical to the previous submission. Thank you, Chair. Um, my son is now shouting finish, so if I could possibly... Yeah, please carry on. <laughs> That's your Sorry. priority uh, duties. Okay, uh, members, uh, any points of clarification that you would like to raise on this one? As you say, the, the main issue is that um, and the reason that it's come back to us is that um, we refused it and the, the judgment now is have they met the um, met and overcome the reasons that ref we refused last time. Um, sure, we have Councillor Anna Braddon and would like to uh, have a point of clarification. Okay, Councillor Braddon, please. Um, sorry, actually, uh, it wasn't a point of clarification. I just think that I was going to say that I think the modifications to the plans have reflected what we asked for. Uh, Chair, can we wait for Michael Sexton to come back? Certainly. Okay, all oh, right, sorry. Sorry. Oh, plus oh, a no, There we go. <laughs> Apologies, I'm back. Shh. Well, I think uh, Councillor Bredman was only making a statement. So. I was I was simply saying that I think that the modifications to the designs 
have reflected what we asked for in the um, when we refused it originally. So I'm content with this now. Yeah, I, yeah, one bit I did miss, sorry for my presentation, I think it's worth noting, I know the Parish Council are going to speak, but I think it's worth noting that there are no local objections in terms of scale and design, which there was objection from the Parish Council and the neighbour on those grounds to the previous application. So the yeah, officers obviously endorse that this is a very positive response to the previous submission and concerns raised locally and by the planning committee. Right, well I expect the parish can speak for themselves and you know. OK, thank you. I don't see any more, so I will go to public speakers now. Um, and the I think the applicant's agent, Matt Hare, is with us this morning. Matt Hare, please. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. I am here. Can you uh, hear and see? Yeah, me? I hear and see you. Lovely. I'm sure you know the form. You, you have three minutes to address us and then the members may wish to question you. So whenever you're ready. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, good afternoon, members. Um, thank you, uh, as ever, for giving me the opportunity to, to speak today. I propose only to speak uh, briefly. Um, you'll probably be pleased to know. Um, you've heard that the application before you um, seeks reserve matters approval um, for the appearance scale layout and landscaping of a scheme of eight new dwellings that was previously granted outline planning permission in September of 2017. Um, you have also heard, and I'm sure you recall, that the, a, a previous scheme for reserve matters approval was considered by the planning committee earlier on in May of this year. Uh, the committee's summary view at the time was that the height of some of those dwellings proposed uh, was such that it would be harmful to the character and appearance of the local area. So following that decision, the applicant's design team uh, conducted a, a thorough review of the scale and design of prevailing housing types in the local area. Um, and that had a particular focus on um, the former um, LSA um, land, which is just to the south of the, the application site, now, as we've heard, is within the, the neighbourhood plan area. Um, in addition to this, uh, we held some informal discussions with the immediately adjoining neighbour at number three, um, Pampersford Road, which is Strawberry Farm, uh, and also with the Parish Council, uh, and we sought further views on, on matters of scale and design from, from those parties. And as a consequence of those uh, actions uh, and again as you've heard from the case officer the the design of the um, previously larger and taller dwellings um, that were that were that were proposed have been changed in order to significantly reduce their overall height uh, and alongside this um, we've made significant revisions to the appearance of those units uh, in order we hope to better reflect the appearance and key characteristics of existing dwellings on the former LSA site all of the houses are all now one and a half storey scale, which is reflective of the height and general building typology of existing houses within the adjacent uh, LSA area. And uh, we're of the view that uh, uh, they are now entirely appropriate for, for the location. Uh, we note the officer report, which is comprehensive and, and, and well written. Uh, we note that it, it recommends approval of the scheme and we fully endorse the contents of that report. And we hope very much that you'll be able to vote to support the proposals today. That's all I really wanted to say to you, uh, but uh, as ever, very happy to take questions. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Uh, well, members, any points of clarification you need? No, I think everything's pretty uh, straightforward. So, uh, Mr. Hare, thank you very much for the moment. Thank you. And we move on to the parish council representative, is councillor Talbot with us, please. Councillor Talbot, are you with us? Is Councillor Talbot with us? It seems not. OK, Councillor Talbot was um, representing the Parish Council. Um, I note that in chat it, it's identifying that Bernie Talbot left the meeting. He may be trying to, um, yeah, he's rejoining. Oh, right, he's rejoining the meeting. OK, we'll wait on a minute or two to see if Mr Talbot 
is back with us. Mr. Talbot, when you're back, I'm calling you to speak. Is Councillor Talbot with us, please? Clearly, Councillor Talbot is having some technical difficulties. All right, I'll, I'll try one more time. Councillor Talbot, are you with us? All right, we'll move on for the moment, and if Councillor Talbot manages to um, get reconnected, um, I will return to him. Uh, in the meantime, um, I might just say, say a, a brief word. I am the uh, local councillor for this area. Um, and my view is that although that, you know, clearly it's regrettable that the, we have this level of um, uh, development on this site, but the reality is the principle is established and the best we can do is to see that the highest standards are applied. So the question today is, has the developer addressed the concerns that led this committee to refuse last time round? Uh, there has been significant improvement in design and the houses are much more in keeping with the area as we've just seen with the presentation. Uh, I might say with some reluctance, I, I on balance think this application is now acceptable and I will be supporting approval. OK, uh, just see if we can raise Councillor Talbot again. Chairman. Councillor Talbot, are you back with us? Councillor Talbot is muted. Councillor Talbot, are you muted? He's got his hand up, but he's muted. Well, I can see that, Councillor, thank okay. you. Councillor Talbot, are you with us? Uh, no, he's still not responding. All right, members. Um, any Chairman, is it possible for him to join by phone if Aaron was to contact him? I'm not sure if Aaron has a contact for him. Um, Aaron? Yes, is, Chair, I, uh, yes, I actually possibly. do have a contact for Councillor Talbot. I'm just uh, emailing them some phone instructions now. Are you OK then? In the meantime, uh, members, did you have any questions for me as a local member? No? OK, we just hang on for a minute then to see if we, we can raise Councillor Talbot. Chairman? Yes? Since you might like to have a question to answer. <laughs> have you got one up your sleeve then? I've got one up my sleeve, yes. Right, um, well. Chairman, at the previous application, we were quite concerned about, because the slope, the site does slope so significantly from the front up higher towards the back, um, obviously they've reduced the story height from two to one and a half. Are you satisfied that that um, will not be so overbearing? I mean, everybody seems to, there have been no objections to this reserve matters application, but are you confident that that will make it a more acceptable development? Um, on balance, yes. I mean, I still think they, they will be quite prominent. Um, and, um, you know, with the, the advance that we've made, that they're now, the design is actually, um, uh, in keeping with the settlement buildings. Mm -hmm. It's still out of keeping, as you saw yeah. with the local bungalows, which are the, in the immediate neighbours. And but, are you, yeah, all these things are balances, aren't they? And are you satisfied? There were some concerns about the accessibility and the swept path analysis. Are you satisfied that the access road is sufficiently uh, is sufficient for the 
cars and the bin lorry. Yes, I think there has been some slight adjustments there. Um, um, and the the highways have not raised objections, so you know it's very difficult to question that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Fain, did you? Uh, Chairman, I'm not just speaking because we haven't yet found Councillor Talbot. I also wanted to ask you in relation to what you were just saying as local member, whether you you said that um, you were concerned about they weren't uh, the design was very different from the bungalows opposite. Would you accept that as the case as the case officer said that the new design with dormers is very compatible with rather similar to that at uh, Strawberry Farm itself, number three Pampasa Road and also 44 and 59 North Road. Well, well, and the settlement in general, there's, uh, the design of the houses throughout the settlement are pretty standard and this does follow that design. So yeah, yes, I mean, it's much better. Um, yeah, I, I, as I was just saying, I, it's clearly doesn't sit terribly well with bungalows immediately opposite. But, you know, on balance, and we are get, getting uh, affordable houses out of a, a development of only eight houses, which you know, has to come into the balance as well. Right, uh, Mr. Talbot, are you with us yet? Aaron, are you having any luck? I haven't heard from Councillor Talbot, I'm afraid, Chair. Well, I fear that we will we'll need to move on. Could okay, we, members. Could, sorry, Chairman, could we not just ring him so he could speak through Aaron Aaron's phone? Do so. No, uh, but I mean, what Aaron was doing was giving him the dial in details, but what we could do is simply ring him. Yes, all right. Oh, Let's, sorry, uh, just a suggestion. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Aaron, if you would please treat, continue to try and contact him, and if we can, we'll, we'll come back to Councillor Talbot. Um, you have Councillor Khan. Councillor Khan, yes. Uh, point of information again from Councillor uh, Bachelor. Uh, <clears throat> um, the original proposal with three reserve matters in this, uh, in May included a link from the uh, development onto the path, the track going over towards the rest of the Land Settlement Association, which has been removed because of the uh, uh, comments from the neighbour of uh, the existing property. Um, how do you do you feel that this will be a disadvantage in terms of uh, accessibility or connectivity uh, in the of the development? How, how do you react to that uh, to that stage? Um, no, I, well, I don't see it as as being uh, significant, and um, we have taken advice with officers, uh, and you know, again, highways have raised no objections and uh, you know to question that is isn't easy particularly uh, right uh, we now have a message from councillor talbot uh, waiting for a call i'm watching and trying to unmute unmute okay waiting by my phone so aaron is, is waiting for a call Chairman, it seems that uh, Aaron and uh, Councillor Talbot are having difficulty contacting each other. We did hear from the case officer, however, that the parish council are not now objecting. And Mr Talbot well, appears to be in touch by that, chat. Yeah, I, I believe they do have an issue that they would yes. like to raise with us. I think chair, I perhaps I should, sorry, Chair, through you, perhaps I could clarify what, what I said is parish council and, and local residents aren't objecting on the grounds of scale as they yeah. did to the previous application, there is still concern raised by the parish council, which I'm happy to go through in the event that uh, Councillor Tower was not able to join us, but hopefully he can put those views. But my statement was purely that there's no objection, local objection in on the grounds of scale, which there was before. Yeah, yeah. I do have Councillor Talbot on the phone with me now. OK, good. So Councillor Talbot, are, are you able to communicate with us? Hello, I hope I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, can hear you. Okay, okay. Good. sorry you're uh, having difficulties. Yeah, I have been trying to unmute, but without any success. Right. Um, Would you like to make uh, a statement then, please? Um, yes, I'm 
Chair of Great Abington Parish Council, and I am speaking on the council's behalf. Um, I'm just turning my sound down a bit, that's okay, it's better now. Um, so um, the Parish Council does continue to object to this development. We do appreciate that the uh, scale and size and uh, presentation of the buildings is much better than uh, we uh, saw formerly. And we're very much happier with this um, layout. Um, we have uh, objected and continue to object to the, um, the the link road, which you'll see on the plan, which uh, goes to the east, uh, and it goes to um, another uh, large piece of land, um, and it, it is as as this site was originally outside the. Um, village framework and the land to the east is also outside the village framework um, and we believe that you know we don't like that being there we think it's um, it just invites uh, a further application for uh, that site the, the, the development of that site would not um, be wholly dependent on that link because the whole of that site, which is probably about um, uh, six or seven acres, um, front onto Pampasford Road. And if it at a later date did need to be developed, then it could be accessed from Pampasford Road. So the, the, um, the link into the site isn't uh, crucial to uh, it, it, any further use of that land. Um, I know that the uh, the uh, applicant has um, got a contractual arrangement with the the person that they bought the land from to have that link, but it still doesn't um, uh, take away the fact that the parish council has objected to this link being there right through the whole um, of of this process. I think that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we see if there's any points of clarification members would like to raise on this. Uh, Councillor Bradland, if you have a point. Thank you, Chairman. I was um, trying to work out because the plan I've got, which it's it's one nine zero zero five zero one, that does not have a link road to the east. So I'm just wondering if um, I'm looking at an out of date plan and I'm which I'm I'm wanted to check which is the plan that's been approved in the amended plans. Uh, well, we can ask the case officer that. that. OK, thank Anything you. Anything you would like to raise with. With Councillor. No, I, it was just really that I wanted to check. OK, which right. plan number we're talking about. Thank you. Um, OK, so if there's no other questions, we can release Councillor Talbot um, down the line. We're, we're still pursuing this and um, Mr Sexton, could you help us with the link road, please? Yeah, certainly, Chair. Um, I believe Anna, uh, Councillor Brothers did quote the correct plan reference, but I will just share well, screen. Actually, I tell you what, I've just discovered that on page 47, it refers to the very first plan referred to is two. 20051-01 and the plan I've got is 1900501 so I'm probably looking at an out of date plan I can't pick up any others from the website at the moment um but all right we we'll look at one you know Mr Sexton yeah chair could you confirm you can see a site layout plan because my teams are telling me you're looking at powerpoint presentation yeah got that but you yeah, so the what the parish council is referring to is this gap here between plots two and three. Um, that gap was there on the previous application. I believe there was some small discussion around it last last time as well. It wasn't a reason for refusal. Um, as highlighted in the the committee report, there is this, and council Talbot, Talbot mentioned there is a legal obligation on the applicant to provide that um, access, but obviously it's not a formal access in the sense that it's, it's a grassed area. 
um, it's not being marked out in the same way as the, as the access road. So as set out in the officer report, we're, there's no reasons for refusal on those grounds in officer's view. So you're, you're, you. you're saying this is not non-material, are you? Effectively, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's fine. Thank you, Mr Sexton. Right, is, um, do we have any other? No well, other speakers listed at present, the... Chair. Oh? No other speakers listed oh, right. at present. No other speakers, good. All right, well, we're into the debate. Should there be one? If not, I'm happy to move this to um, a vote. I I'll second see. that, Chairman. Yep. Fine. Okay. If there's if there's no objection to that, um, can I take this by affirmation? The, the proposal Agreed. Agreed. is to Agreed. 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 All right. Anyone against? No, but Chairman, did we clarify that he had permission of the Parish Council to speak? I, I haven't recorded Yeah, that. he did. He said that himself, yeah. And uh, I know he does anyway. So that's fine. Uh, OK, so that is approved by affirmation. And we move on. So uh, next. <clears throat> Chairman, I, dare I suggest that as it's nearly one o'clock, maybe a good idea to break before this starts? Yeah, OK, then is that uh, agreeable to members? Chair, yeah. yeah. consider the question. Uh, yeah. OK, so uh, before we move on to the next one, then we'll have a lunch break. Um, 30 minutes, we'll come back at 1.25 then. 1.25.
Thank you very much, Chair. You are now live again. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to South Cam's District Council um, Planning Committee. Um, just before we move on to the next item, our acting uh, vice chair uh, has stood down for this one. Um, and so we need to appoint another temporary vice chair members. Um, uh, Councillor Bradnam has very kindly volunteered. Are we all happy that uh, Councillor Bradnam acts on this one as vice chair? Agreed. All happy? No one against. Good. So, Councillor Bradnan, if you wouldn't mind uh, controlling the speakers, please, for me. Thank you. OK, we're on agenda item eight, page 51 of the agenda papers. This is reference 20 stroke 02128 stroke HFUL, and it's number nine. Hallett Gardens, Great Shelford. The proposal is part single, part two story extension and associated works. The applicant is Mr. and Mrs. Norman. The key material considerations will be outlined by the presenting officer. Uh, this application is brought to committee because uh, referring to, to planning committee by Great Shelford Parish Council and the Office of Recommendation of Approval conflicts with the recommendation of the Parish Council. A meeting was held on the 22nd of September, whereby the application was considered in accordance with the principles set out in the Council's constitution. Given the material considerations raised and representations raised by third parties, combined with the planning history of the site, a referral to committee was justified on this basis uh, by the delegation uh, arrangements. The officer recommendation is for approval and the presenting officer is Tom Gray. Uh, Mr Gray, would you give us your presentation, please? Thank you, Chair. Can you confirm that you can see the first slide, please? I can indeed. Thank you. Um, some some updates for members to consider. Um, first off, um, so the first thing is that one element of the assessment uh, that wasn't included in in the committee report. Um, this is regarding the impact on the setting of the Great Shelford War Memorial, um, situated to the north of the application site. Uh, this War Memorial is a Grade Two listed building. Uh, listed under the Planning uh, Listed Buildings and Conservation Areas Act 1990 for its special architectural or historic interest. Section 66 of this Act requires decision makers to consider any development which affects a listed building or its setting and has special regard to the desirability of preserving the building or its setting or any features of special architectural or historic interest which it possesses. When considering any impact upon its setting, officers consider that given that the War Memorial is approximately 60 metres from the proposed extension, uh, and the design um, of the extension that is in keeping and subservient um, in scale, um, it's not considered that any harm upon the setting of this listed building uh, would result in accordance with uh, policy MH14 of the local plan and the MPPF. Um, there's been two representations that have been received from objectors. The first one relates, uh, the first one comes from number eight, and the second one is from number 10. Um, the resident at number 10 raises concerns about the transparency of the process. Um, but to clarify, both of these letters were sent to committee members in the last few days. Um, I'm just going to summarise uh, what is uh, what the email uh, states. Um, the first point that the um, resident number 10 raises is the proposal is uh, not in keeping with the neighbourhood and is overbearing and results in loss of light for six months of the year, creating significant shadow affecting family rooms and wellbeing. Number two, 
The extension breaks the plan's northwest facing building line. The layout of the houses 8, 9 and 10 is critical, being, being built in an area of conservation and facing a historic high street and war memorial. Number three, there have been many objections from the community and the parish council. And number four, there are obvious design options to other, other obvious design options to create space. So um, I consider these representations and um, there's no um, in regard to no other material considerations within these points that have been raised that have not been part of this committee report or within this update. So I continue with my presentation. So the application site is situated in the Great Shelford conservation area and development framework. Um, this is the application site here, number nine. Um, it's noted that um, this the consent was granted for this dwelling along with uh, eight other dwellings as part of the um, a scheme in 2004. Um, it's pointed out that one of the reasons um, for this creation of the layout was to preserve the uh, openness of this area here um, and conditions were placed under consent to remove permitted development rights. Um, it is also noted that these dwellings here um, are closer to the high street than these current dwellings here. So this slide, the existing elevations and the proposed elevation from side by side so you can see the differences. The only alterations to the front is the um, uh, the increase in height of the front windows on the ground floor. Um, the, the there are um, surrounding the property there are other dwellings um, with full height um, windows. Um, they do have a split screen uh, in terms of a split glazing with a bar across. Um, however, um, I haven't thought it thought it necessary to impose a condition on this consent regarding glazing details, uh, given that the um, uh, the first story um, also has glazing of a similar design and other dwellings do have a full height um, windows and doors in other properties. If, however, the um, committee members have been inclined to approve um, the application, then we could require glazing details to be conditioned if it is necessary. It's the, just the changes in height in terms of the existing proposed and um, at the, the side elevation where most of the changes are happening. Um, there will be a single storey uh, rear extension measuring just over three metres in height, coming out about 3.4 metres and a two storey extension, which I'll go on to in a moment. So these are the next two um, elevations. The first elevation is the northeast. This is um, where the two story extension would sit, so it would be lower than the ridge height of the existing dwelling. There will be three windows um, in the side elevation, two in the existing dwelling and one in the proposed dwelling. Um, I have conditioned these uh, in my report to be obscured in order to protect uh, a neighbour immunity in terms of overlooking. The, um, the rear, rear elevation um, shows that the uh, use of uh, matching materials such as render and brickwork. Um, again, I've shown on the height and uh, depth, they're coming out by 5.3 metres, a height of 7.6, again lower than the existing ridge line. Here's the proposed and existing floor plans. So at the top, you can see the existing floor plans. 
the bottom you can see proposed. Um, so to the left of it is the first floor plan where the, the two storey element will be. And to the right is the proposed ground floor single storey extension. These are the existing and proposed site plans. And the proposed site plan on the right here, and I've put the distances on in relation to number 10. And in terms of distance to the actual building at number 10, it is approximately 6.2 metres. To the garden wall, approximately 5 metres. So in terms of some context, um, I've got some site photos. The bottom here on the left hand side is where I took the photo from. So this is in the rear garden of number nine, Hallett Gardens, looking towards um, the gap between number nine and number 10. Um, what you can't see particularly well from this photo is that there's two um, windows in the side elevation of number 10, one at the first floor level around here where our mouse is and one in, around here around where the mouse is on the ground floor. This, these already face the existing dwelling um, and serve as secondary windows to the habitable room space in the first floor and also the ground floor. This is the view taken towards the other neighbouring property at number eight. This is the view from the garden space of number 10 towards where the two storey rear extension would be. And this is taken from number eight. The front of the dwelling, um, this, is, this is taken from um, Tunwell's Lane. Um, but the only changes, as I say, is uh, the full glazing to this window here and this window here. This is taken from um, High Street towards two dwellings and um, towards number nine and number eight. It's approximately 20 metres from the public footpath. This is from the gap um, between number 11 and towards the application site. Um, so we're looking towards the application site over here. So there is a great Shelford conservation area appraisal. Um, in this uh, area appraisal that was adopted in 2007, um, as noted, there's two important views. Uh, in this area, as well as an undesignated open space. First um, important view concerns um, uh, the high street along here, this view here, and there's a photo that I've taken uh, to show what the view is like at present. Um, there is also another important view um, in terms of towards and along Tunwell's uh, lane, uh, which is shown here. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is the view from the War Memorial. It's approximately 60 metres uh, from, the, from the proposed extension. Um, uh, there, are, there is some tree cover, um, although it will be uh, visible for some time, some months of the year. Um, uh, I don't consider it to be any harm upon the setting of this listed building. So the key considerations are the impact upon the character and appearance of the conservation area and the setting of the war memorial and amenity impacts upon the number 10 and number eight and also impact upon the trees which is covered as part of the agricultural method statement that is one of the approved plans if the committee members are minded to approve this application thank you Chairman, 
The case officer, um, oh, sorry, Michael Sexton is offering to share a plan on screen. Is he in there yet? I yeah, think that's yeah. from earlier, Councillor Bradnam. Uh, yeah, that, that's the previous. Oh, I apologise. Uh, okay. Have we got any any points of clarification for the case officer? Nope. Um, In that case, we'll move yeah, on then to the public speakers. So public speakers. Um, is Mr Kidd with us, please? Mr Ian Kidd. Yes, hello. Hello, Mr Kidd. Yeah, welcome to the planning committee. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well and see you. So, uh, you know, the form is you've got three minutes and. Uh, thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, Hallett Gardens is in a conservation area. The site is significant. It's the historic center of the village bordered by the High Street, the War Memorial Green and Tunwells Lane. And in 2004, the application to build Hallett Gardens was subject to intense resistance, scrutiny and changes. The planning officer at that time said the development, which became 13 properties, was intended to respect and retain the existing open parkland setting of the site and the views of this from the adjoining streets and public places. To accord with the character and appearance of the surrounding conservation area, to locate the dwellings in a self-policing position and to arrange the buildings in clusters to create a sense of place. Given its location and history, it is virtually a conservation area within the conservation area. Yet the conservation officer could state, without even visiting the site, there are no material conservation issues with this proposal. Your planning officer was also surprised and had to ask her to make a site visit. He can confirm this, but her mind seems already to have been made up. Yes, a number of dwellings in the development have since been given planning approvals, but none of the scale and impact of this, none were two story. The loft developments were internal and involved no external extensions. These have no impact, nor have the modest and discrete ground floor changings at three other uh, properties, uh, only one of which is visible obliquely from outside the site. And unsurprisingly, there were no objections to them. This ob objection, sorry, this application, is of a much greater scale and significance. It's two stories. It can be seen clearly from the War Memorial Green and from the High Street, and many of the objections are from High Street residents. The extension will breach the shared property line at the rear of numbers 8, 9 and 10, and that was a key feature when Hallack Gardens was eventually approved, along with the clustering of properties, their self-policing and the maintaining of sense of space. In addition to breaching conservation area principles, as noted by many villagers in their comments to the planning authority and to the parish council and by parish councillors themselves, the proposals will have a major impact on numbers eight and ten, either side of number nine. The case officer has shown the distances to number ten. He didn't show any distances to number eight, which is more or less on exactly the property line of the single story extension. Uh, finally, Chairman, um, objections uh, made to you and the Parish Council are numerous, many more than for other extensions in the village. We urge the committee to accept the views of the Parish Council, who are the custodians of the village, who instigated the conservation area and who asked for the application to be called in. We also urge the committee to accept the force of the objections from village residents and immediate neighbours. Uh, we believe the application should be refused. One other very brief point, uh, there is this late uh, addition to the agenda dealing with the glazing and uh, I certainly request that there should be a condition uh, requiring uh, that any new full length windows uh, at ground floor level should be split. Uh, thank you. Right, thank you very much. <coughs> Members, any points of clarification for Mr Kidd? Uh, Chairman, yeah. Did, yeah. I, I didn't hear if you asked um, Mr Kidd if he's got the permission of the Parish Council. He is an objector, he is not. Ah, okay, sorry. Right. 
No, OK, I don't think we've got any questions, Mr. Kidd, so thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. Yep. Um, if we can go to Mr. Carter, who I believe has a statement uh, from the applicant uh, that he's going to read out. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I won't time myself, but I believe this will be less than three minutes anyway. Uh, the proposal, the application is for a proportionate extension for the fa applicant's family. The extension is set over two storeys with the majority of the floor space at ground floor level, specifically designed to remain in keeping with the existing building and surrounding properties. Principle, policy S7 applies and allows the principle of extensions to dwellings in this location, subject to weighing up other material factors. Design, the building is part of a development of nine uniquely designed homes. This quality has been reflected in the design of the extension. The development will, will appear unimposing in the street scene, complementing and preserving the character and appearance of the area. The area generally comprises two storey pitched roof forms. The extension maintains this and retains existing separation distances between properties. It is in proportion with the existing dwelling and surrounding area. The same can be said of the materials, render, brick and cedar cladding are proposed with natural slate to the roof, complementing the building surroundings. Conservation area. The council's conservation officer concluded the proposal preserves the character and appearance of the conservation area and assimilates into the street scene. Amenity. There will be no additional overlooking. The majority of openings proposed face the host property's garden. Side windows will be obscure glazed and will not create overlooking greater than present. The extension includes a single storey element to the southwest and existing separation distances are maintained to the northeast. The works do not overbear neighbouring properties. Overshadowing. The council's design guide allows for certain degrees of overshadowing. For example, due to its eastern position, number 10 overshadows the application site in the morning. The existing house, number 9, overshadows the adjacent shared driveway and to some extent number 10. Any increase of overshadowing as part of the proposal would be insignificant. With regard to number 10, the extension passes the 45 degree rule set out within the design guide. On the southwest side, the extension is single storey. This element of the proposal is located to the northeast. Its impact on overshadowing to number eight will be negligible. The extension does not significantly overshadow or block views and is considered to be in line with the adopted design guide. Trees. Contrary to representations made, the scheme does not cause any impact on trees, nor are any to be removed or pruned. Uh, and they make reference to the submitted arboricultural report. And in summary, the works proposed are in keeping with neighbouring properties and will appear as part of the original dwelling. The extension is of high quality design and does not harm the immunity of neighbours or harm the conservation area. It is considered to meet the requirements of the local plan and design guide. It represents a suitable extension to an existing dwelling, a reasonable, reasonable aspiration of the property owner. It is respectfully requested that planning permission is granted. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you very much. Um, we can't have clarification there, there's no one to answer that. So we move on to the parish council representative. Uh, is Councillor Cattle with us, please? Yes, thank you very much. Good. Um, OK, I have permission of the parish council to speak. Good. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Start with that first. <laughs> I'm, I'm <saying> <laughs> it. <laughs> OK, hey, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for this opportunity anyway. Um, yes, I mean, we have very much, um, mis very many misgivings about this. Number one is the amount of information that was um, initially uh, thought through before the whole site was developed in the first instance and the requirements of that to conserve that area in a particular way. As has been stated, there are single storey developments that have gone on, but this is the first of a double storey development. And although everybody's saying that it does not affect the street scene, from the front internal of the, the site, no, it doesn't. But that site is very much on view from external areas. And you saw a photograph taken from number eight's back garden across the, the building line going out uh, towards the north of the village. There was not a building in sight. 
And once this extension goes on, that's, that view will be eliminated completely because the extension will be there instead. Um, from the War Memorial, there is another line of sight going across the back of the three properties, eight, nine and ten, which will be destroyed once that building, once that extension goes up as a two storey extension. As a single storey, it might be acceptable, but it's the height of the second storey, which is the issue. Um, there is an impact um, on trees in the area. The street scene, as I've already said, is not just internal, it's an external street scene. And basically the building lines were done in such a way that the street scenes and the view lines would not have been impacted by any building in Halat Gardens. And so we are really thinking that we don't like it because it is changing the whole nature of that area, as has been said, of a conservation area in the historic centre of the village of Great Shelford. Um, we consider that the build, the extension is far too big, um, that there may have been other design options, but on top of all of this, the very nature of the positioning of that property is that I would like to know where it is intended that contractors vehicles and materials would go as there is no delivery access across the whole site. Um, and we are talking about massive build, uh, massive contractors vehicles that would need to come in if only to pour the foundations. Um, and I think that the whole site is going to be totally impacted by this. It's not just the three houses, it's whether this sits with the original development plans of that particular site. As such, we recommend refusal of this extension. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, members, any points of clarification you'd like from the councillor? I can't see any. Any, uh, Councillor Bradman? I can't see any. No, um, okay, fine. So thank you very much indeed for your contribution. Though. Thank you. And um, we move on to the local member if he wishes to speak now. That's uh, Councillor Fain. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I would like to speak. Um, I don't want to repeat any of the points that have been made by the Parish Council, by Mr Kidd, or by the very reasonable submission on behalf of the Normans. I declared an interest because uh, one of the objectors is a, was until recently a fellow Parish Councillor, and therefore I don't think it's appropriate that I should be a member of the committee for this item. However, as was stated, this is a crucial site, both for the conservation area in the village and also for the War Memorial Green, to which numbers 9 and 10 are the closest houses and which are visible at most times a year from the Green. Um, as was stated by the Parish Council, there were very careful, effective negotiations backwards and forwards between the Parish Council and planning officers back in 2004. A lot of correspondence relating to that. And this uh, development was very carefully designed, uh, not only in terms of layout and numbers, but also in terms of grouping of the houses. This being the first extension of over 50% in area will inevitably have a significant impact on that. Um, some impact as was accepted by the uh, presentation for the applicants on light to number 10 as well. Um, I don't want to, to take a view on the, the merits or otherwise, as I said, I'm not a, a member of the committee for this purpose, but I would suggest that in, in relation to paragraph 59, the conditions. When this was built, working hours conditions were imposed, and it is particularly important here because of the adjacency to the War Memorial site and to other houses, indeed far more important now than it was then. That's a case that has been accepted by this committee in relation to other developments, including in this village, that uh, the impact of development can be much greater when it, those developments have neighbours than on larger sites, as this was in 2004. And the other thing I would just say is it would have been 
apparent to members from the photographs the importance of that exceptional beech tree to the front and I think it is important that we ensure that the sorry that the committee should consider ensuring the protection of the roots of that tree because there is so little space around there for storage of materials and so on uh, that it, it is important those conditions are respected. Thank you chairman. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any points of clarification there? If I, I could just uh, make one that I wasn't clear what direction you're pointing us in, Councillor, in terms of um, approval or refusal. Chairman, I was deliberately leaving that to the committee. <laughs> right, thank you very much. OK, I can't see any um, points of clarification. Can you, Councillor Bradnam? No, uh, no, not yet, sir. No, fine. Chairman. OK, thank you very much then, Councillor Fain. And in that case, we will go to uh, the debate. Uh, does anybody wish to speak? We have Councillor Roberts. Right. Councillor Roberts, please. Many thanks, Chairman. I'm long in the tooth enough to actually remember when this was a, an idea and a concept um, 15 years ago. And I do remember it being classed as a very important site and a very sensitive site. And for those of us that often go by it, uh, it's clear um, that it was important and and really we do have to maintain that. And I think the arguments that we decided upon 15 years ago apply equally, if not more so now, where we see villages really having to battle to retain these um, very important physical areas uh, within themselves, especially when it's within a village envelope because the pressure becomes ever more. It, it seems to me that looking at the drawings, you see it's a substantial extension to the property, both widthways and heightways and, and changing really very much what that house looks like. And I think it will have a very detrimental um, effect on the two next door neighbours, but actually generally on the site and the area. I think that there comes a time when you have to say to an applicant what you what you wish for for your own needs is not complementary with the area that it's within and I think that this is one of those to me quite a clear case that it's now become a detrimental to the conservation area detrimental and I disagree with the officer uh, conservation department I'm afraid detrimental to the, the war memorial um, and, and detrimental uh, to the whole area. Um, so my vote will be going for a refusal. It's, it's quite clear to me that this is a step far too far. You'd also be risking um, this becoming a precedent in that, that area. You, you give this to one uh, and then other people obviously would expect it to be for them and they may use the same arguments. Our family is growing, um, but I'm sorry, I can't go along with it. I shall be voting for a refusal. Thank you very much, Chairman. Right. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, <laughs> just a bit, just a bit to clarify matters that there that you're um, objecting on the on the basis of inappropriate development within the conservation area. Yes, that would be HQ one, I say, Kelly. Yeah. And and over development of the um of the of the uh, site itself, it's it's too big, Chairman. It's becoming too big. It's becoming far too much of a a statement uh, rather than a blending in. And I, I'm, I'm just trying to get the you know the yeah. dots on the eyes. So, so that would come in HQ one anyway. That's general thank design and stuff. Okay, thank you very much. We move on then. Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, Heather Williams, please, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have to say that I, I agree with Councillor Roberts. I think that this is not suitable for the area that it is. I think the conservation area um, deserves our, our full attention and, and the place that it is in the setting um, that, that what is proposed is, is too big, it's too large. 
it's both floors, it's not even the first floor. Um, and I do think it will have a big impact on that area and that I'm minded to refuse it. It's just overdevelopment and not suitable in the conservation area. Uh, all right, thank you very much. Um, Chairman, we've been reminded by uh, Mr Stephen Reid uh, that we might be coming up to four hours and we might need to seek approval to carry on. All right, let's just do that now then. Thank you very much. So we're already, well, it says five hours on my little clock here. So uh, yes, um, do I take it that we labour on? You're not going agree, to agree. Agree. So all, all agree. <laughs> Okay. Um, against? No. Okay. So we've we've done that. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bradnam. Do we have more speakers? Yes. There's um, uh, myself and then uh, Councillor Martin Khan. Right. Thank you. Um, so, so Councillor Bradnam, then, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to um, express my. Um, feelings that although this uh, obviously the parish council are anxious about this and I also have some reservations about the actual construction phase because of the tightness of the site um, but I think I don't subscribe to the view um, of Councillor Roberts and Councillor Heather Williams and I, I think it could be done and could be um, acceptable within the curtilage of the development, if you like, the whole development. Um, but my my concern is that uh, in condition, sorry, rustling of papers, just hang on a moment, in condition um, C, because of the risk of the northeastern elevation of this number nine, perhaps overlooking um, windows in number 10, um, the case officer has suggested that the first floor windows on that northeastern elevation should be obscured glass and permanently fixed shut. And I notice that this is actually two windows on a bathroom. And I would request instead that, yes, they're obscured, but could they be made into top hung vents rather than fixed shut? Because it would be horrible to have a bathroom where you couldn't open the window. So uh, it, it's just if the if the committee is minded to approve the application, could we just amend that elsewhere in the application? I thought it said unless it were a top hung vent and that hasn't gone into recommendation C because I think that would be preferable. Um, but in terms of the proposal itself. Um, I, I, I think it is reasonable within the um, surroundings. Thank you, Chairman. Great, okay, thank you very much. <coughs> I think we've got Councillor Khan, have we? <coughs> Councillor Khan, yes, please. Uh, Sorry, Tim. Could we just have some clarification from the officer that that might be an acceptable uh, amendment to the condition? Well, it's up to the committee to decide whether it wants to change the conditions. But uh, we go to. Well, so, so, do I, so do I need to propose a, an amendment to the condition then, Chairman? In a moment, let, we okay. might as well check with the officer. Sorry, Councillor Khan, we're, I'll be with you in a moment. Uh, um, Mr. Gray, so what do you think about that proposal? My understanding is it is uh, on C. Condition C it says apart from any top hung vents at uh, the start of that condition. Um, oh, OK. So, so OK, that's fine. That's, so, okay, thank so you. that's all fine. Then. That's so fine. you're happy with that, Councillor Brednam? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, Councillor Khan, then give us um, some words of wisdom. OK, uh, I looked at this, uh, the, 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 the report and uh, felt that I couldn't really judge the site without going and having a look. So I went out and uh, looked at the site from, from the road because it's a private estate, I can't go on the actual estate itself, from, from the front and from the back. Uh, uh, and my impression was that the impact, the visual impact is not going to be significant. I agree with uh, Councillor Bradman, that uh, either from the front it would virtually not be seen, uh, from the rear, from the high street, it's very well sc screened. 
Uh, and the, uh, in some ways, I would prefer a two-story development, which uh, a bit part extension, which looks part of the building, the single-story development, which uh, uh, which looks like an obvious extension. Uh, it, so I didn't, and it wasn't going to. The, the there was quite a long rear garden. It was quite distant. I didn't feel that this was actually going to be a, a, an impact either from the War Memorial or from the High Street. That significant impact. It was going to seem like part of the existing buildings which there. So I didn't feel there was any real ground. I didn't feel there was any real grounds on on visual impact grounds. Uh, the one thing that I would feel that might have been a, a reason for concern was the fact that the uh, a number ten that could be overshadowing from the extent of the uh, the rear extension. However, the, the uh, number ten has got quite a large garden. I don't think it would make a significant. Uh, I, my general feeling is that it would only be in very late afternoon in in summer. Uh, and I don't feel that um, that would necessarily be a, a significant enough reason to refuse it. So my general feeling is that uh, um, I don't think a case, a sufficient case has been made for uh, its impact on the adjoining houses for it to be, um, and the, the visual impact I don't think is significant enough. So I will be in favour uh, of approving this application. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, Councillor Bradnam, do we have any further speakers? No, Chairman, we don't have any other speakers at present. Fine, OK, so we let's tie this up then and bring it to a conclusion. Um, Mr Carter, can I just um, check with you the um, my understanding of those who may wish to vote for refusal? I've got uh, inappropriate development within the conservation area, loss of amenity for neighbours with the uh, size of the thing. I think this all comes down to HQ straight one, probably. Yes, Chair, I, I have drafted a reason um, just quickly whilst uh, members were talking, which I'm happy to, to read out if that would be helpful. Yes, please. Uh, so I, what I've drafted is by virtue of the size, location and visual impact of the proposal, it would fail to preserve or enhance the character and appearance of the Great Shelf Conservation Area. The proposal would result in less than substantial harm, but there are no clear public benefits which are identified to outweigh that harm. The proposal would therefore fail to comply with the requirements of policy, policy HQ1 of the SCDC local plan, the MPPF and section 72 of the Planning, Listed Building and Conservation Areas Act 1990. Um, I haven't included anything about the impact on neighbours. I wasn't clear that that was part of any proposed reason for refusal. So if, the, if it is, could that be clarified? Let me just check with members then. Those who may well be uh, minded to refuse, um, is there anything you wanted to add to Mr Carter's? Um, interpretation. I, Chairman, I'm happy with what um, Mr. Carter has said uh, as a reason Carol for Williams, yeah. OK, fine. I don't yeah. hear anything from anyone else. So I'm happy with that as well, Chairman. OK, thank you. We, we go to a vote then because I'll make a roll call because obviously there's likely to be some difference of opinion. So it's um, the proposal is for approval. So if you agree with that, you're for it. If you want refusal, you're against it. And you want to abstain, you abstain. So, um, uh, and the reason for refusal, as is, which uh, was just outlined by Mr. Carter. So if I can take the votes then. So Councillor Bradnam, please. Four. Four. Councillor Khan. Four. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Four. Four. Thank you. Councillor Councillor Ripith. Four. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Against. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Against. Thank you. Councillor Richard Williams. Four. Four. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Against. Against. Thank you. And my vote is four. So the outcome of that is one, two, six in favour and three against. In that we've only got nine uh, members at the moment in that uh, Councillor Thane was not voting on that one. So that is approved with condition. So thank you very much for that. And we move on now to item number nine. But before that, I'll just say thank you very much to Councillor Bradnam for sitting in uh, as vice chair. And um, just to check that 
Councillor Thane is, is back on duty again for that purpose. Chair, I'm, I'm back and I'm on duty if required, yes. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Um, OK, so we're on item number nine. This is page 65 of the agenda. The reference is 20 stroke 01369 stroke HFL and it's at 24 Mill Lane, Linson. Uh, the proposal is a single story extension. The applicants are Mr and Mrs Foote. Uh, key material considerations will be outlined by the presenting officer. Uh, and the reason that this is coming to the committee is it's referred to planning by Linton Parish Council and the officer recommendation of approval conflicts with the recommendation of the Parish Council. A meeting was held on the 18th of August whereby the application was considered in accordance with the principles set out in the Council's constitution. Given the material planning concerns raised, particularly with regard to the conservation area design and materials, and the significant level of local objection, a referral to committee was justified. The officer recommendation is for approval. The presenting officer is Mr. Tom Gray. Mr. Gray, over to you for your presentation, please. Uh, please can you confirm that you can see the first slide please i can indeed yes um so <coughs> yeah, this is uh, 24 mill lane uh, in linton um the application is for a single story extension um there's been a couple of supporting statements from the applicants uh, and the agent on this application uh, this information has been uh, distributed to committee members uh, in the last uh, few days and the site location plan is shown on the left here um, and the site constraints on the right. Um, the, air, the application site is located in the Linton Conservation Area and Development Framework. Um, the application site is also adjacent to a local green space um, shown in this, this green area here. Um, it's also located adjacent to a public right of way shown in this on this blue line here that runs through the green. Um, it, part of the application site is within flood zone two. Um, however, the location of the um, extension will be situated north of this. So on the left here have the existing elevations on the right the proposed. Um, the um, extension concerns uh, uh, an increase in height of the front uh, front portion of the extent of the current um, part of the dwelling in this part here um, and it also concerns um, an extension to the rear uh, along uh, near to the uh, public right of way. So i show you the measurements so the front and um, five meters in terms of uh, the gray area of the public right of way this is actually on higher level ground than the application site um, and would measure approximately 3.2 meters when taken from the level of the public right of way the materials used in the um, extension would vary from um, timber cladding to the front here to match the other um, existing side of the dwelling and also um, slate for most of the roof for some of the roof um, horizontal cladding for part of the roof and vertical cladding and a metal roof for this part of the extension you see there is a variation in the ridge heights um, too This is taken from the rear of the site, these elevations. Um, you can see the change in ground levels here um, in terms of um, difference between the public footpath adjacent to the site 
and the application site where the extension would go. So when measured within the application site, it would measure approximately 4.6 metres. When taking into account the ground level changes uh, within the local green space, it would measure approximately 3.5 metres according to these, these proposed views. These are the existing uh, and proposed plans as well as the proposed site plan. And I put them side by side so you can see what the differences are. So this, these are the wing, uh, it's the proposed wing of the um, dwelling extension. Um, you can see the variation in uh, roof types. Um, if I show you the measurements in terms of the, the distances, about four metres from the public right of way, about 3.5 metres from the local green space, and approximately 16 metres to the nearest um, dwelling. So some site context for you. This is taken from uh, further down Mill Lane uh, towards the application site here. Um, and this is the public right of way. This is taken from within the application site. Again, taken from the application site, but from the rear, from the rear of the site, you see the change in uh, ground levels, and just beyond the hedge here is the public right of way. This is the view towards the public right of way and where the extension would be positioned. This is taken from the public right of way through a gap in the hedge. This is a view taken along the public right of way. This view is taken from the local green space towards the application site. The extension would be positioned here. This view is taken from the northwest of the application site. This is taken from the southwest of the site. Closer to the application site, but within the local green space. And then from the uh, nearby church of St Mary's. So the key considerations um, are the impact on the character and appearance of the conservation area, conservation area and the setting of the listed buildings, um, the impact upon the local green space, amenity impacts and impact upon trees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, members, any points of clarification you would like here? <coughs> no, can't see any. Sorry, Chairman, could we yes. could we ask the case officer just to go back on his slides again and show us the one from the southwest? Yes, that one. Um, so on that slide, the extension would be going from right to left across in front of the hedges wouldn't it okay yes that's right you're looking thank from the, the river side yes thank you so it would be att attached the house is the white building on the right isn't it so it would be from there across okay thank you okay okay i haven't got any other speakers so we'll move on to public speakers then please uh is mr bennett with us please Mr. Henry Bennett. Um, yes, I'm here. Oh, good. Can you hear me? Let's switch on your camera and so on. Well, welcome. Uh, Sorry to keep you so long. Uh, you know the form, do you? You've got three minutes to address us. Uh, somebody's turned off your camera, I think. There we are. 
Yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah. I live in Mill Lane and several local people have asked me to contribute today. Having read the planning officer's recent report, I am relieved that the matter has now been referred to you as a committee, as it appears that their approach is very confrontational. They vigorously challenge every single point made by us residents and the parish council, and they have signally failed even to mention the nine page report commissioned and paid for by residents from a planning and conservation expert, Corrie Newell. I trust that you have all been able to read her report as she is to her, to our knowledge, the only expert who has inspected the site and knows the area intimately. If, as they confirm, the officer's report has been produced without any site visits, even if due to COVID, it should not carry the full weight that the decision requires. It feels like a real disconnect. Conservation areas are always special areas and Linton's is one of the biggest. Local people value this and feel strongly that preservation should be emphasised more than development. When so many of us follow the rules conscientiously, often in tiny details, it's not surprising that we object to a major proposal like this one. We all understand your definition of conservation area to preserve or enhance the local character and buildings may be traditional or more modern, but both need to fit with the character of the area. This case is definitely not borderline. The building is a very plain extension running the full length of the public footpath with no windows or doors, much taller than normal single storey and with a hard unbroken roof line mostly metallic, which will never weather. It takes centre stage, blocking views in all directions of trees, skyline and other houses and gardens. Such matters are subtle, but important. Every such development degrades the character of the conservation area until eventually there will be little left worth preserving. But this case is certainly not subtle. It completely destroys the prospects of both its immediate neighbours and pushes right up to the village green. The officers bandy words like innovative, subservient, symmetrical, but none of these is remotely true or relevant. People find it uncompromising and even slightly hostile. They are claimed that metal roofs are acceptable because they are found on modern farm modern farms is frankly rather absurd. The conservation area has no such examples. So just finally, the recent rebuilding of 24 Mill Lane has been much praised for being very sensitive and enhancing the area. This, however, is a very different animal, and I'm not surprised that so many people are able to discriminate and have objected. I very much hope that you will do likewise and refuse this application. Many thanks. All right, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Bennett. Members, at any points of clarification you'd like to take a cup with Mr. Bennett? I can't see any. Nope, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Bennett. Much appreciated. Um, we now move to, um, you, no, you, first we look at the letters you all members would have had the letter and the email. So the letter was from the applicants that you all had earlier in the week. So he's chosen to um, make his points that way rather than appear today. Um, and you also have an email um, from um, his agent also outlining their position. So I'm sure you all read those and are aware. So moving on to the parish council then, is Councillor Bald with us, please? Hello. 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 Oh, nice to see you. Yes, I do have permission from the parish council to speak. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you very much. So when you're ready, then you know the score. Thank you. Um, I think that um, Mr. Bennett has actually stated most of the case. Um, he's very close to the area, so he knows it well, as we all do. 
Um, the report submitted by the Protect the Lane Group has not been recognised by the officer. It's critical as site visits by the officer and committee have not been possible. So we refer you to this and the illustrations in it as they support the parish council objections. <coughs> the officer report is inaccurate. Linton Conservation Area appraisal is accepted and accepted by planning inspectors, as we've seen in previous um, appeals. Most of the site is in flood zone two. This includes the extension, which is to the west, not to the north. The officer pointed to the garage. There is also a pool and raised terracing as part of this um, application. The site is at the core of the conservation area. It's not at the edge of the village as in paragraph 44, but it's close to the centre, it's next to the infant school, it's near shops, GP and the church. It's a book to the village green. It's not a local green space. Village greens have special and higher planning status. The site is visually more closely linked to listed buildings than indicated. It's linked to Millbrook number 18, the mill, the mill house also linked to heritage assets around the green, 20 and 22 across the pathway, with the lint walls and the surrounding cottages. Neither the officer nor the design statement has fully recognised these factors. The house has already had many additions and extensions and is much larger and bulkier than its neighbours, which are mostly modest cottages. Now another 50% is to be added, as big as the original house, expanding the footprint massively. This is too large, it's, the extension is not at all subservient. It's too big and the extension will be impressively close to the boundary of the public space and right of way. The materials are alien to our conservation area. The metal roof found in modern industrial and agricultural buildings is totally out of keeping with the conservation area and local building materials. It's been described as a design progression, paragraph 43. But this is not a farmhouse. This is not a farmyard and it's certainly not an industrial building. This metal roof is completely out of character. It's said that the extension is for lifetime living, but there are no modifications to accommodate older age or disability needs. The hedging in the conservation area is not protected and should not be used to disguise poor design and over large buildings. The officer report cites policies to enhance, protect and preserve historic assets, historic character, local distinctiveness and to be informed by existing design. Policy HQ1 of the local plan requires new developments to make a positive contribution to its local and wider context, appropriate in scale and nature, conserving or enhancing important natural and historic assets in their setting. This application fails to meet all of these criteria and should be rejected. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, members, any points of clarification? I don't see any requests. No, well, thank you, Mrs. Bolt. Excellent, okay, Councillor Bolt. <laughs> Hey, thank you I'm very much. Okay, I'm still a councillor. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I am the local member and uh, I will um, reserve my comments until later in the debate. So we are at the debate now. If somebody would like to uh, open the discussion. Councillor Thane, do we have anybody? No takers at present, yeah. No takers. All right, I'll make my comments at this stage. Then. So, as has been. I'll move on to speak, Jim, if you wish to come last. Yeah, OK, fine, that's fine. Uh, Councillor Bradnam, is it? Yeah, Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I find myself in um, some difficulty because, um, however hard I have tried, some of the documents on the website I haven't been able to open. 
Um, and so I feel I have not got the full story and I certainly haven't seen the comment from uh, Corrie Newell, which we were referred to by Mr Bennett. I don't know if that's been redacted or not included. Uh, anyway, so I feel at a disadvantage there. However, um, I uh, so I'm, tr I'm sort of minded as to whether I ought to abstain, having not been able to see the full information. However, I have been to Linton and I have visited this area on other planning applications, and so I am somewhat familiar with the locality. Um, and I do feel that I, what I would be concerned about was if, um, as we know sometimes when uh, developments are made, that ground levels are changed. And so if the um, committee is minded to approve this, I would seek to ensure that that ground level difference that um, the, uh, that Mr Gray pointed out to us between the public right of way and the ground level of the house to seek that that is maintained so that so that the um, extension is still lower than the level that it would be if it was still at the public right of way level if you see what I mean so there is so that it's set down into the ground and not proud um, but I, I, I'm mind, I'm sort of trying to work out whether I'm entitled to vote or not All right, thank you very much. Next, you have um, Councillor Heather Williams. I mean, that, that's your, your choice yeah. entirely, of course, Councillor. I would say that um, uh, the report is, is on the website. I have read it. Um, yeah, um, okay. it Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to clarify that we, we have had those emails circulated to us. Yeah. But to ensure that they are on the website as well for, for mm. full transparency, because obviously that's something that we're taking into consideration and one we did get quite late on. So um, if officers could reassure me that those will be in the public domain, because if they've been able to, to speak today, then the public, there would have been public record of it. Shall I just um, check that with Mr Senior first then? Yeah. Mr Senior, are they or are they going on the website? Hello. Yep. Um, I believe they go on to the planning portal rather than the the agenda page. Yeah, the planning portal so, indeed. So I, I'll check that. that. That's not something I'm in uh, charge of. OK, but I, I will make sure that they. But the, but the point is that they're, they are in the public domain. Yes, indeed. OK, I think Chairman Mr Gray wants to comment on that. Uh, OK, do you mind, Councillor Williams, if I go to him first? That's fine. OK, Mr Gray, you want to tell us something? Yes, I can confirm that the um, both the supporting statements, one from the applicant and one from the agent, has been uploaded onto the website. Okay, all right, fine, thank you very much for that. Then. Councillor thank Williams, you. did you want to continue? Um, yes. It so on to the um, proposal itself, I, I do find myself in two minds on, on this one because it is it is quite substantial and I find the conservation, obviously there is there is a bit of a conflict in, in opinion over the conservation area. Um, and so I, I very much will be looking forward to the local member chairman making his, his view um, and that uh, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what others say, but I, I think this really isn't a straightforward one. It very much is a balance um, and it does seem quite sizable. That's uh, that's my thoughts at the moment. Thank you, Chairman. OK, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Khan, Chairman. Councillor Khan, please. Well, uh, Again, um, actually, I felt that I needed to, I couldn't judge from the map much about the site, so I felt I needed to do a site visit, and I made a visit to the site uh, from, and viewed it from the public road and the public footpath. Um, I felt the the difference in level was noticeable. We can't actually see you, Councillor. Uh, gosh, I, I thought my camera was on. Try again. 
Yeah, but you're you're out of shot. You're back in. Sorry, I beg your pardon. I was leaning to the okay. side. OK, here I am. Um, like the previous thing, I, I felt I couldn't uh, judge from the report uh, the site. Uh, the plan didn't really tell me a lot. And I went to look at the site from the road and from the public footpath. Um, the 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 area is quite interesting. The conservation area is very mixed. Uh, every the buildings are very different. In each building seems to be built from a different material. The building on what the other side of the footpath is built half of brick from the side face uh, of no particular distinction facing the actual building, and a splint on the other side, looking in the other direction, which is screened from the building concern uh, the, the the development site. The levels uh, that it would refer to, there's quite a large difference in level, a surprisingly large difference in level between the footpath and the uh, and the development site, which obviously has to be maintained. Um, I felt that it was really like almost like a, 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 an extent. A lot of buildings could have been farms in the previous time. It's quite an older part of the building. It seems like a could, what's proposed really looked like a quite like a natural outbuild. And the main concern that I had, and which was referred to, is the idea of a metal roof. Um, um, and which could be uh, intrusive uh, and a bit out of keeping. I don't, oh, apart from the mill itself, which may in the past have had metal roofs, I don't think most of the other buildings around would have had that. But that I think possibly could be sorted out by conditions in terms of the actual finish of the metal roof. Um, it doesn't have to be bright silver, could be other colours. Um, uh, 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 and I find it difficult to feel that it really has a, such an impact on the conservation area that it, it, it was sufficient to refuse it. I felt it could, in fact, um, seem relatively natural part as long as the roof materials were satisfactory. So I, I think in the end, I, my feelings that I would um, I'll support this application. All right, thank you very much. Well, Next, you have Councillor Roberts. Chair. Councillor Roberts, yeah, please, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my concerns at this point are on process. Um, and making sure that we have got that right. Um, certainly some members have indicated that they couldn't find uh, the um, input that had been put in from um, a, the village's planning consultant, not the parish council, but the residents. And certainly the gentleman who spoke for residents spoke of his concerns that he didn't believe uh, it, it was seeable and it was in nine pages um, and I'm therefore thinking um, I don't want us to run down a line of making a decision and then it can be challenged because we haven't followed due process and I, I've looked through again sitting here with it next to me and it, it doesn't really give us an idea that there's been a, a very formal um, input from residents it just talks about you know some residents and some third parties um, and I think where you have a, um, a lot of information put in by residents in a formal manner um, it should actually be very clear um, where those are and that they could be found immediately. Now if there is some query over it chairman I, I would suggest that we should defer this matter um, if that is the case, and I'll wait to, to hear, but if there's any question that that is not easily found or um, in fact if it's not there, then I think we would have to defer the matter. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, I mean, I I can confirm that it is on the planning portal, the, uh, the nine page report, but I only looked at it at the weekend. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah, I was. It's not terribly easy to navigate that that portal. I, I would say, but let's take advice anyway. Um, yeah. Uh, Mr. Uh -huh. Carter, perhaps you would like to comment on this. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think on the basis that the document has been available in the public domain, I don't think there's uh, there's any issue that we need to be concerned with. Perhaps the case officer can just confirm that he has taken that representation into account in his deliberations. Uh, but beyond that, I think I'm satisfied that the information was available for everyone to see. Thank you, Chairman. Can, can we have a view of the legal as well, please, Chairman? Yes, if it's, it's, Mr. Reid, uh, would you agree with that? Uh, Chair, if I may, can we hear from the case officer in response to Mr. Carter, oh. first of all? OK, Mr. Gray, please. Um, I can confirm that the representation from the Protect um, Mill Lane Group 
was taken into account under the representations from members of the public section. All right. Thank yeah, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Tom. Does, are you telling us that it's there and it's easily found? Because what we appear to be hearing is that it's difficult to find it. It's not clear and therefore you might have to be a computer expert to have got into that. Can, can, I, can I clarify, please? No, well, no, I think Mr. Reid is going to clarify for us. Chair, I, I think I, I need to hear comments from all of the committee members before I comment in case I then have to say something which. Uh, well, that's, that's the principle, isn't it? If it's on, yeah, it is yeah, available. No, no, do not interrupt, please, councillor. And please turn off your uh, camera for a moment. Sorry. Now, Mr. Reid, it's a point of principle. Is it since is the since these are in the public domain, i.e., we have already established that they are sitting on the planning portal, then isn't that sufficient? Um, Chair, uh, my view is that if planning officers are satisfied that the, that the document is available to the public then I would not be recommending a deferral on the basis that um, somebody might have not spotted it. Right, OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think Mr Gray has said that. Um, Chair? So yeah. Mr Brown, I want you to speak again. Sorry, uh, Councillor Roberts first. Did you want to come back? Um, no, actually, I would like clarification from C Councillor Brabner because it was her point that I was taking up, Chairman. Well, I understood okay. from her that she was saying that she had not been able to find it. And well, I'd like to hear Anna's, uh, Councillor Brabner's view. Fine, OK. Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you, Chair. What I was trying to say was I could see the documents, but I was not able to open them. So at that point, some time ago, and prior to that, I had not been able to open the document. But while we have been in conversation about this planning application, I have been able to open the document and I have looked at it. So to reassure Councillor Roberts, it was simply my computer having a, a problem earlier on and in the previous days but it has actually opened up now. So can I just reassure you, I have seen the documents that were submitted. Thank you. Excellent, okay. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Councillor Bradman. Thank you. Councillor Thane, do, do we have any further? Councillor Heather Williams would like to speak. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I was just gonna make a suggestion that sometimes if something is of technical or importance then we can have an appendix in the report and perhaps that would avoid the problem in future um, but if we are legally tight um, given the fact that we've got no extension and agreed and we are past the determination date by some weeks um, I think there would be a, an element of concern of over deferral from that perspective um, but I understand the, the principle of why I was being asked that was all chairman. Oh. OK, thank you very much. Uh, OK, I think that's down to me now then as the local member. Um, well, the first thing to say is that there's been an, an, a number of extensions and alterations to this property. All of them, I might say, have, have been welcomed and there's been a significant improvement in the, this house. I'd also say that um, uh, a further extension would probably be acceptable. The difficulty is that it probably isn't this one. Um, the issues here are certainly the bulk and size of the extension and very much the use of metal in the roof. As you've seen from the photographs which have been taken all around, uh, this is a very prominent position, a uh, very sensitive position. It is, it is in fact surrounded by listed buildings and it is sitting on the edge 
the, in the setting of the village green. So this is the village green, which has a higher um, rating in terms of conservation. And so we need to take all this very seriously. As I say, I think a further extension is possible, but I don't believe it is this one. It's too large and the use of uh, metal in the roof is incongruous. Um, particularly within this very sensitive setting. So for that reason, I'm afraid I can't support this application as it doesn't meet the demanding requirements as far as I'm concerned of policy HQ1. Um, uh, Councillor Henry Batchelor has also asked me to make it clear. Henry Batchelor is the other local member that he supports this view um, that I've expressed and uh, will also support refusal. So I'm asking you to refuse this one. Um, there is a prospect for something here. I'm afraid it's not this. They need to come back with a revised plan. Thank you. Right, so I think we're probably ready to go to uh, a vote. Um, can I just check first with Mr. Carter that those of us who are voting for refusal on the basis of uh, um, size uh, and materials uh, under HQ1 uh, is acceptable? Chair, I've taken the liberty of drafting some wording um, as with the previous item. If you're happy for me to read that out. Yes, please. So I've drafted that by virtue of the bulk size location and choice of materials, the proposal would have an unacceptable visual impact on the character and appearance of the Linton Conservation Area. The level of harm would be less than substantial, but there are no clear public benefits which are identified to outweigh that harm. The proposal would therefore fail to comply with the requirements of policy HQ1 of the SUDC local plan, the MPPF and section 72 of the Planning, Listed Building and Conservation Areas Act 1990. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, members, you all noted that. Um, can I? Um, Councillor Khan, yes, you want to say? Um, I, I was going to say that if one was prepared to approve it, can I suggest that we have a condition to approve roof materials before, uh, uh, the condition to have roof materials approved, because uh, that might be a possible way. I think that's probably already a condition, isn't it, Councillor? Mr. Gray, did I see that that was already conditioned? Yeah, that's right. Um, it's it's condition C. OK, fine. So uh, hopefully that will satisfy you, Councillor Carl. Sorry, I've, uh, yes, OK, that's fine. Yeah, OK. All right, then, members, we're going for a vote then. Um, so the recommendation from the officers are for, is for approval. So if you agree, with approval, then you're for. If you want refusal, you're against. If you wish to abstain, you abstain. Uh, so I'm going to do a roll call now for the votes. And the first councillor is Councillor Bradnam, please. And Chairman, on the basis that I have seen the documents, I am going to vote and I'm going to vote to refuse. Refuse, thank you. Councillor Khan. Uh, for. For. Thank you. Councillor Thane. Against. Again, thank you. Councillor Hawkins. For. For. Councillor Ripeth. Against. Against, thank you. Councillor Roberts. Against. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Thank you. Councillor Richard Williams. Against. Against. Councillor Wright. Against. Thank you. And my vote is against. So the outcome is one, two, uh, eight against, two, four. Therefore, this is refused. OK, thank you very much, members. So item nine is complete and we move on to item 10. Agenda item 10 is on page 83 of uh, our agenda. 
and it is reference S4252 stroke 19 FL. We're at Falmere, Cherry Tree Field, Shepreth Road, Falmere. Um, and the proposal is a conversion of cow sheds to three bedroomed house with inter internal annex and stable building. The applicant is Mr. and Mrs. Fulton. The recommendation is delegated approval. Key considerations will be covered by the presenting officer. Um, Chairman, can I just <laughs> clarify with you uh, or with Aaron? Um, you should have Councillor Peter Berg, who's the Planning Committee Chairman of Falmere Parish Council, um, but I can't see his name on the list as yet. He, he certainly is was prepared to be coming. Oh um, yes, he's there. Well, Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, no, is is with us. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the um, the application has brought the committee to allow consideration of parish council objections. Um, the presenting officer is David Norris. So over to you then, Mr Norris, for your presentation. Thank you. Can you confirm that you can see the slides? Yes, we got that. Thank you. OK, so this is an application to convert some redundant agricultural buildings into a single dwelling. This is the application site plan that was submitted with the, with the application doesn't really give a lot of context, although it does provide um, the location of where the site is. However, it's useful to go to the Google Maps, to give you a better idea of where the site actually is. So the red mark shows the buildings. To the north, you have the Shepworth Road, where it meets the village, and to the south, you have Falmere and Falmere cemeteries here. And upon that, this is a show the site in better detail. Existing access from here. These are the buildings in this location here. Some redundant sort of stable outbuildings here. No real neighbours nearby. There, there is a building here. This is the view from the, from the road. You see the access already exists. You see the buildings there. You will have read from the report that these buildings already benefit or have benefited in the past for a prior approval for a conversion into two dwellings, sort of bungalow type dwellings. Talk about that more in a moment. That's the existing access, access track, which will be used for this development. It also shows the trees around the site. There's uh, parked in the access, looking north, you'll see decent visibility displays, a very straight road. Similarly, looking south, it's a decent straight road with, with good displays. This is the front, elevation of the building looking from the road. As you'll see, there's two structures there with a linking structure, a little covered yard type building. That's the side elevation. Again, the other side elevation. And that's looking out from the rear of the buildings, looking towards, there's a footpath on the top of that ridge, which is not particularly um, visible from, from the from the site or from the path down to the site either. There's an owl box which I took a picture of. There's a view driving south looking into this is one access the proposed well sorry the access to serve the development is here. Buildings are behind this hedgerow here. And looking from the road at the buildings, these are dilapidated buildings that will be removed. Looking from the south, looking towards Shepworth, you can just about see the building there, substantial trees and hedgerow along there. Again, a blown up version, you can just about see the buildings here, these are the buildings that will be removed. So this is a proposed site layout plan. Access taken from the main road, some improvements within the site. This is a proposed stable block which will go in this location here, an L shape. Timber building with an onduline type roof. These buildings to be removed. 
So these are the two buildings that exist, and currently the central yard runs right the way through. Um, you'll see parking going to this location here with a small kind of garden area around here. Additional planting is proposed around the boundary. So these are the elevations. Um, this is the existing building, two elevations, and this is how they will look when extended. Again, two other elevations and how they will look afterwards. So as you'll see, the main form of the building is retained, certainly the footprint. Um, they are being extended slightly upwards to create a first floor within there. And this central area here is being extended to create a hallway and access to them. Materials will be timber, dark stained, powder coat aluminium windows, and the roof will be a profile sheeting that will contain solar panels within it. So they won't be sat on top of the, top of the roof material. This is the floor plan. Um, as you'll see, ground floor, living room, kitchen, the one bedroom downstairs, integral garage to get the cars off of the site. It also includes an annex, which I believe is for a future family member, possibly. Um, so it's a one bedroom annex with a room at first floor and its own living room and a kitchenette on the ground floor. So the, the central area is hallway with a, a um, landing upstairs. Above the living room and kitchen will remain open with the bedroom at the back. Um, we have received a revised curtilage plan. This is not a revised red line plan as referred to in the report and is clarified in the um, update note. What we sought to do was because the impact of a conversion in the countryside sometimes is felt through the domestic paraphernalia that can um, appear within the garden area. So what we've asked the applicant to do is to submit an amended plan that shows a revised curtilage, a reduced garden area in effect. That's what this plan shows. Probably worthwhile seeing the drawings of what was approved under Class Q approval. Um, as you will see, they are basic drawings, are rudimentary, um, and so it's in effect two bungalows that were approved under that, two separate three bedroom bungalows. So the key planning considerations, um, as you'll know, this site is located outside of any development framework, and therefore there's a general presumption against residential development. However, the MPPF does allow for the reuse of rural buildings to provide homes in the countryside. And furthermore, policy H17 of the local plan does allow for the conversion of rural buildings into dwellings. There are, however, certain criteria which you'll have seen the parish council pick up on. The first one is that the buildings must be capable of conversion. Um, as I've already said, the benefit of having a, a class Q in the past demonstrates that they are suitable for conversion and that it will be a conversion rather than a rebuild. We have also received additional structural information that demonstrates that these additions can be held upon the existing structure and that the steel frame is, is still fundamental to this. So it's, it's not a it's not a rebuild. These are a, a conversion. Um, one of the other points that was brought up is the reuse of the building for employment purposes. This is one of the um, bullet points within policy H17 as well. The, I think the, the key issue here is the fact that the class two approval has been granted and would be granted again. Therefore, it's not considered to be reasonable to expect this building to be marketed for employment use as there is a genuine fallback position, which I can talk about more in a moment. The other criteria is enhancement to surrounding area. Obviously, this is a subjective assessment, but it is considered that this scheme will make good use of these derelict buildings and the planting of trees will provide a positive enhancement to the area. The design of landscaping, again, is, a, is one of those, is a subjective issue. Um, as you'll see from the drawings, the two bungalows that were approved under the approval weren't of any architectural quality. Um, they didn't cont contribute to the area. They didn't really respect the character of the buildings or the agricultural form. I believe that the creation of one home here, a well-designed home, um, incorporates materials that are appropriate in the area and the formation of the covered area, like a covered yard type, is kind of a traditional way of extending agricultural buildings. There is a small increase in the height of the buildings, which we accept, 
However, this has to be balancing each other benefit. Um, the vehicular access, yes, you'll have read the comments of the Highway Authority. They are certain that the access is suitable to serve one additional dwelling. Again, furthermore, the class two approval allowed for two dwellings being served from this access. I mean, the other, before I go on to the class Q approval, it's also worth bearing in mind that the applicant is proposing a, a raft of sustainability measures. I think that's paragraph 33 in the report. This is ground source heat pumps, solar panels, water recovery, etc. So those sustainable elements need to be factored into this. The fallback position of the class Q approval um, is, you'll have heard earlier in the meeting, that we need to be mindful of what could be carried out under permitted development or under previous approvals. And this has been established in case law. Um, and I think you know, there's a recent or well, fairly recent case where it said that local members must take into account previous permitted development or prior approvals when considering applications, you know, when assessing the difference between the two schemes. Um, so in conclusion, when considering this application, it's been necessary to assess the current proposal against the prior approval that had currently or previously been granted. That approval was for two dwellings in this rural location, whereas this scheme is for a single home that boasts a range of sustainable features. It is not reasonable to require the applicant to go through a marketing exercise when there's a clear fallback position. Furthermore, whilst a single home may be slightly larger than the two houses approved, it is considered that this impact is not harmful, is outweighed by the benefits of creating a single home. If nothing else, it's also you know, halving the amount of vehicle movements that would be coming from this site. And that's it for me. Thanks, Chair. OK, thank you very much. And just to be entirely crystal clear that uh, uh, perhaps you guys like the comment, the weight we should give to the existing um, approval. You know, we, and to make clear, you know, class Q means that uh, there is an existing approval, which is the fallback position and whatever we judge on this, we need to keep that very much in mind, don't we? Yeah, absolutely, Chair. OK, good. Um, uh, Councillor Thane, do we have any speakers, please? Is Councillor Thane with us? No, but I think Councillor Bradnam wants Councillor to... Councillor Bradnam is wanting yeah. to speak. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, I wanted to clarify with the case officer um, two things. Um, he said, and I had seen that there was this revised curtilage. It's described as a revised curtilage plan. And I wanted to be clear. I think uh, Mr Norris said that, in fact, it was a revised red line plan. And I wanted to be clear in short that the red line which is tighter around the building is, is the plan that we are actually referring to, um, because I'm sure as members know, if the red line went around the whole field, then a number of such buildings could in principle be built on this site with other constraints taken into account. So I just wanted to be sure that this red line does just go around the existing agricultural buildings. That's the first question, if I may, Chairman. Yes, um, the red line plan is the original plan. However, this subsequent plan is a curtilage plan. So that defines the garden area. So the remainder of land outside of the curtilage plan doesn't become brownfield or previously developed land. We've got a specific condition that ties that second plan to be in the garden area only. The rest of the land remains as paddock or agriculture. That's great, thank you very much. And the second question I wanted to ask, and this might just be um, a, a trick of the eye as it were, but on the um, photographs you had of the existing agricultural barns, they looked much longer from um, roughly speaking east to west than the current planned proposed building is and I just wanted to check is the proposed building actually shorter 
than the current barns or is it the same length? The buildings are the same length. I think that's where I took the photograph. I've emphasised the horizontal of it rather than the reality. So yes, it's using an existing footprint. Could you go back to that photograph of the barns, please? It was about three or four in your in your presentation, I think. Can you see my screen now? Yes. This is the elevations. Mm, yes. Yes, that that photograph made the buildings look much longer than the proposed um, plan. I mean, that looks, I don't know how long that is, but it looks much longer than the plan. Right, I'm sure the uh, officer can tell us, is this the same size? Yes, yes. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a four bay building, I believe. Yes, right. and they're using the full length. How long would that be? Um, I think if they're five meter base, I think it's 20 meters, I believe. OK, but the question was, is it taken the whole length as we saw there? Yes, and it is. Yes, you've it confirmed, is. yes. OK, thank you very much. Uh, um, Councillor Khan, please. Sorry. Hello, I wanted to ask about the um, about the stables which were indicated uh, on the you're talking about dem demolishing some old dilapidated buildings and rebuilding the stables. Are they within the actual application area or are they being developed separately as agricultural buildings? And if they are being built as agricultural buildings, um, don't, are stables for horses uh, uh, acceptable as agricultural buildings or do they need planning permission? These are equestrian stable buildings that fall within the, in the red line area of the, the property. Please. The view or the assessment of stable buildings is really is a visual impact for the most part. Mm. My view is that the stables with their timber cladding will be appropriate in this location. And I suspect it's likely that the area at the front will become maybe paddock area. I don't know or the surrounding fields, but yes, they are be being proposed as part of this application. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, yes, Mr Norris, can you tell me the the change in the um, configuration of the where the lines are drawn now? Can you confirm to me is what you now call uh, referring to as the pasture land? Is that in the same ownership as the application site land? Yes, it is in the same ownership. It is? Yes. Thank you. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, no more points of clarification, so we have moved to public speakers. Uh, uh, is this Chair, Mr. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams has asked to speak. All oh, right, okay. Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thanks, thank Chair. Sorry, it was it was a late one. Um, sorry, yeah. can I just, just ask the officer to, to just clarify something about the fallback position? I, I know we've been here before um, with fallbacks, but um, is, is the argument then that there's a realistic prospect of the previous planning commission being implemented, and therefore that's the fallback. Just to clarify. Yeah, that's pretty much summed up. In the case law, which was very similar, it related to the class Q consent, and the challenge was that the local authority um, had given too much weight, I believe, in sort of simple terms, to a class Q fallback position, and an objector had previously reviewed the decision. I think it was Tom Ridge and, and Mallin Council. Um, but the inspector said, well, I can actually read it. He said, in my view, therefore, the officer did not misrepresent, misrepresent the in his advice to committee on the fallback position. 
the provision that class key was correctly interpreted and lawfully applied. Um, the, and he basically saying he would have erred in law if he hadn't told the council that there was a realistic fallback position on there. So, I mean, we, I suppose, as I was saying in my, in my report and my recommendation, what we're really considering this against is there is a, a realistic prospect of two bungalows being created here through the class queue. So uh, there are yes. against one dwelling. Okay, that's a yes, yeah. said, I think. Yes. <laughs> yeah. no, thank you. I was reading I was reading the case myself and it was the, the realistic prospect point. So thank you. That answers the question. Excellent. Thank you very much. Right. So if we go to public speakers then, um, is Mr. Daniel Fulton with us, please? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Thank Welcome. You. You, have you got your camera on? Or uh, you can take yes. Yes, I do. Is it showing? Hang on. I, I just need to get the, the officer to take down his um, presentation, please. I can't see the speaker. Right, that's right. It's working now. Yeah, it's working now. So okay. thank you very much. So, um, you know, when you're ready. Yes. Uh, so I raise these points today, not because the Fuse Lane Consortium has any particular view on the planning merits of this particular application, uh, but because it's essential that the council applies the law and planning policies fairly and uniformly in all planning applications across the district. Um, the first point I'll raise is in regards to the statutory consultation re response of the local highway authority. Uh, the local highway authority asked for a two meter by two meter visibility display. Um, I don't know Shepworth Road well. Uh, in fact, I think I've been down it twice. Um, but it's my sense that there are not a lot of pedestrians on Shepherd's Road and that it is primarily vehicles. Uh, and it, I also recall that I believe it's the national speed limit applies, uh, which is 60 miles per hour. Uh, and I would like to suggest that if a car is traveling at 60 miles an hour, a two meter visibility display is not going to do any pedestrian or vehicle any good. Um, I'd like to suggest that the advice of the local highway authority is irrational and that it also ignores the county council's own adopted highway development policies. And it is also contrary uh, to the relevant SPD that has also been adopted by this council. Uh, whether or not safe access can be created is one of the principal planning considerations for this application. However, condition four would defer any assessment of the size of the visibility displays uh, to the discharge of conditions phase. The council's policy under the present administration is not to consult the public parish councils or statutory, tea, uh, con statutory council tees on discharge of conditions applications. Uh, and I question whether it's reasonable uh, for this committee to grant planning permission today whilst deferring one of the primary planning considerations um, to the discharge of conditions phase. Um, the revisions to the curtilage plan um, uh, I'll just say um, the, the law on this is very clear that a reconsultation needs to occur uh, any time uh, that failure to do so might, quote, deprive those who were entitled to be consulted on the application on the opportunities to make any representations that given the nature and extent of the changes proposed, they may have wanted to make on the proposed application as amended. Um, that's a high test to pass, and the citation for Mr. Reed on that is the High Court's 2017 ruling in Holborn Studios Limited versus Hackney London Borough Council, paragraph 79. Um, and um, I think the highway safety considerations here need to be taken into account. They haven't. The council cannot safely rely on irrational advice from the local highway authority. And I, I think this needs to go back to officers for further consideration. Uh, and I would thank the committee for listening to me today. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Fulton. Uh, any points of clarification from members? No, I can't see any. So thank you very much for your contribution, Mr. Fulton. Thank you. And when we move on then to um, the applicant, uh, Mr. James Fulton. Is Mr. James Fulton with us, please? Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, can you see me? Yeah, I can. Do I take uh, no relative of the previous? <laughs> no, no relative uh, uh, to, the, to the previous uh, speaker. 
Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman and Councillors, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for um, uh, for hearing our application uh, this afternoon. Uh, my wife uh, Emma is actually going to um, say a few words about our application uh, this afternoon. Um, good afternoon, Chairman. We weren't aware of any planning procedural breaches, and have been working closely with South Cairns Planning Department on our application for some considerable time. We know the local area extremely well. I grew up lo locally and have lived in South Cairns all my life. We are, in fact, great family friends to the two farmers next to this site, the Meads and the Sheldricks. We fully appreciate this is a sensitive site. We purchased it, purchased it with the prior approval for two houses, but would like to convert the barns in a sympathetic, sensitive and sustainable way to create a family home. We went through South Cam's pre-planning advice and closely followed the positive advice we received. We limited the windows on the side parallel to the footpath, as though it is screened by the trees and some considerable distance away, we wanted to ensure the visual character of the barns is maintained. To ensure the conversion is sustainable, all heating would be provided by the ground source heat pump. All rainwater from the roofs would be collected and reused in the garden and home and the solar panels would provide a large proportion of the electricity required. The solar panels we wish to use are laminated into the metal roofing sheets so it would not affect the aesthetics of the barn. We are wanting to plant additional native trees that will provide some screening but importantly provide additional habitats for wildlife. We've put up bird boxes, relocated the owl box with guidance from the Barn Owl Trust and are maintaining the hedge to promote bird nesting sites. The plan showing the proposed curtilage around the barns will safeguard the site from future development and retain maximum land for livestock and agricultural use. We know we have the consent to build two houses, but hope you feel this proposal for an energy efficient and sustainable home is more suitable. Thank you for your time in considering our application. It's been a very long journey getting to this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much. We've still got a minute left though. If you... <laughs> well done. Okay, let's see if any uh, wants clarification. Members, any points of clarification you want to pursue? I don't see any comments. No, okay. Well, thank you very much for your contribution there. Sorry to have kept you so long on that. Okay, members, we're now going to hear from the Parish Council. Is Councillor Peter Berg with us, please? Yes, I am. Um, just before I start, I'll just confirm for the benefit of the committee that I speak today on behalf of the Parish Council with approval from my fellow councillors. Excellent. Good. Thank you. So whenever you're ready then. Thank you. As officers note, the replacement of the existing agricultural barns with this large house in the open countryside needs to be judged against policy H17. The report acknowledges there has been no attempt to market the site and instead presents an argument as to why the barns are now unsuitable for employment use. However, none of this is documented as part of the applicant's submission within the public case file and appears to be an assertion being made on behalf of the applicant by officers. The statements also totally ignore the local context. In the last three years, there have been five new steel framed agricultural buildings granted permission within a one mile radius of this application site. September this year, we have a new grain storm with grain store with permission on Family Road. August this year, a new agricultural storage building on Long Lane and another one on Family Road. March of 2019, a new barn for storage of hay and straw on Green Lane. And in September 2017, a new portal frame building for card storage on Falmere Road. We therefore do not accept that these current barns meet the criteria of redundancy and believe it is detrimental to the local surroundings to allow such buildings to be converted to residential use, only to then create a need for additional agricultural buildings to be constructed in the open countryside. The, as has already been noted, the application in front of you is materially different to what would be allowed under permitted development. It also does not appear to represent a reuse of the existing structure in any meaningful way. All exterior cladding is being replaced, the roof structure is being replaced and raised in height, and in fact only the vertical columns of the portal frames are being retained. It is acknowledged that the existing foundations will need supplementing, and the fact that the alignment of the windows in the submitted plans clash with the locations of these portal frame columns 
cast doubt on the intention to retain even this element of the existing structure. Therefore, it seems hard to argue that this is a conversion of the existing buildings in any meaningful sense. The other crucial test within policy H17 relates to being sensitive to the character and appearance of the building and locality. Felmere has a single designated public footpath that connects the village of Foxton, and this is in regular use. The barns in question are visible from this path across the open fields, and the proposed increase in height of the building and visual change from a pair of agricultural barns to a large domestic dwelling will adversely impact on these open countryside views. In addition, the 20 square metre panel of two storey glazing proposed for the southeast elevation will reflect the sun and further draw attention to the changed character and the scale of the building within the surroundings. We therefore disagree that the application is sensitive either to the character and appearance of the current building or the locality. So to sum up, this application fails to meet the requirements of policy H17 on three grounds. The buildings are not redundant and therefore is, there is clearly demand for similar buildings for agricultural and employment use within this immediate locality. The proposals are changing the scale of the building and reusing little if any of the current structure and the increase in scale, changing character of the building and extensive use of glazing is not sensitive to the locality and will have a detrimental impact on the visual amenity of the open countryside visible from Falmere's last remaining public footpath. We therefore request members refuse this application on the basis that it is not compliant with adopted policy. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, any questions for Councillor Burke? Let's give it a second. Yes, uh, Councillor Hawkins would like to. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Burke, thank you very much for uh, your uh, your statements. Um, you are, do you take um, you accept that there is already a uh, prior approval for these buildings to be used or converted into two smaller ones. So from your statements, can I take it to mean that you prefer to see those two buildings than one building? Uh, yes, we would prefer those buildings on the basis that there is not the increase in height of the building and there wouldn't be the linking section with the large area of glazing which will draw real attention to the scale of this uh, new development. The originally proposed two buildings would more naturally sit within the footprint of the original barns. Okay but the footprint hasn't changed though has it? No but the height has and it's the adjoining section that create, creates a much larger, larger mass than the, the current two separate barns. Right, I see. So it's the massing that is the issue from your exactly, and visibility from the public footpath. From the from the road, it actually would be uh, fairly well obscured, but the foot, public footpath, it would appear as a, a dominant item on the landscape. All right, thanks for that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I don't think I've got any further uh, speakers. So, so Councillor Berg, thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. OK, um, local member, Councillor Roberts, did you want to speak now? Or you... Yes, if I may, Chairman, yeah, thank please. you. Yeah, um, I, I just quickly like to go back to some background about the um, previous approval. Um, that was given when we didn't have a five year land supply and when we didn't have a local plan. Um, it was, as you saw, a very basic drawing. It was almost like a, a, a back of a cig cigarette box. Um, and it was put in by the person who owned the land then, I think just to see, he was flying a kite to see if he could get approval, um, but it's not the same applicant now. So I would also wonder whether, um, you know, the um, two bungalows um, is, is even realistic that, that that would happen, because I think that the, the people who have now bought it are, are clearly expressing what that they are looking for a, a house for themselves there. Um, I would say also, I would also query the talk, the officer described the buildings as dilapidated. Well, they're not dilapidated. Um, they haven't actually been up all that long. I think they've been up in, put up in about the last 10 years or so. They were put up to um, have um, cattle in them, uh, miniature cattle, which the uh, previous owner um, breeds, and that was put up there. I, I suspect that we may get another application on other land that he has round about. What we're looking at here 
is, in my opinion, a new build in the countryside, which is against policy. Um, as the parish council planning chairman has just clearly expressed and, uh, and explained, there's really nothing left of these ca cattle sheds um, in this application. Um, you, you cannot call leaving, possibly leaving four pieces of metal in four corners of a site, a, a, a conversion. Um, it's clearly a new build in the countryside. It doesn't fit in with the criteria of that. Uh, it's not an agricultural um, farm workers use or anything to do with agriculture or horticulture. It's just somebody who wants to build a nice house in the open countryside. And that is very much open countryside. When you come in from the A10 along that road, right until you get to the start of the village, there's nothing. There are no houses on that side whatsoever. It's completely um, attractive countryside. Uh, it builds up at the back there to Foxton Hill, uh, which is very important. We get lots of people walking um, on that public uh, um, track there because it's in the open countryside. It's where the villages of particularly Foxton and Falmere go to enjoy their rural surroundings. And I would suggest that it, it's completely inappropriate and setting dangerous precedents to be going along with something which is a new build in the countryside. Um, you know, you are opening it up to, to every farm around about to put up something and a couple of years later declare that it's a, open for a barn con, for a, a conversion. Um, so I hope that members will actually um, support the parish council who, you know, you, you've listened to what um, Councillor Berg has, has expressed and it's very well thought out. We're not being nimbies, but we are saying that when you have policies which are about protecting the countryside, and the Lord knows, we all know that in every one of our villages, the pressure on our precious landscapes is huge. And I would hope that um, on this occasion, you would support the, the parish council and refuse this application um, on the grounds that it does not comply with policies. It could have been put up for, um, a, 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 for somebody else using it as a barn. As Councillor Berg has explained, we've had numerous applications lately for people who are desperate for barns to use for themselves as agricultural barns. And yet this site was never ever attempted to be put up on that market or even for a small business purpose, using it as it is. Um, but you know, it's not acceptable really to be changing this into a house. So uh, I hope that members will look kindly on my parish council and also remember their own parishes. You start going along with this um, in one village um, and it has a, a ratcheting effect. It will happen more and more and we will lose more and more of our precious country landscape. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. I'll come back to you on the policy specifics um, for refusal later if that's all right. Uh, I have some speakers. Do you want to, is this to ask clarification from uh, Councillor Roberts, uh, Councillor Bradnam first? Um, sorry Chairman, um, no I thought we were in, uh, I, I mistook where we were, I thought we were in debate. It might, no, might no, it's just debate speaking this. as a local member at the moment. Uh, is that the same for you uh, Councillor Khan? Yes, I thought it was. Yes, I thought it was the base. Yeah, fine. And Councillor Hawkins, same. Same, chair. Yeah. I'm um, okay. Well, let's let's get on with that then. So, Councillor Bradnam, it's the debate. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, I just wanted to get some clarification, if we can, from um, <coughs> officer on this employment reuse, because I must say. Uh, OK, Google imagery is not entirely up to date, but I must say I looked at those buildings and I thought, well, they don't look very old. Um, and I see a lot of farm buildings, so, you know, it just struck me that they looked quite new. And I noted this comment at paragraph 21 on our page 87 about the employment reuse. 
and it says it requires either a demonstration of the unsuitability of a building for employment use or a lack of demand for employment use evidence through 12 months of marketing and we've been we've heard from the parish council that it hasn't been marketed and then the case officer has said that it doesn't need to have been marketed because it's already got permission for two dwellings can we just have some clarification on that because my feeling is that well i would just like some clarification please yeah, OK, let, let's do that. I, I think I go to um, Mr Carter, please, if you don't mind. Sorry, David. <laughs> no, that's fine. Whatever. Thank you, Chair. I mean, David may be better placed to, to answer as he has the detail, but uh, I think the point that he's making in the report is that because there is already a class Q consent for residential use on the site, the officer view has been that the marketing uh, wouldn't achieve anything because there is a fallback position of residential use. Um, but Chair, I think you may want to hear from David Norris on that as well. Right, OK. OK, Mr Norris, would you want to add to that? You're muted. You're muted, David, you're muted. Sorry. Right. Yes, Chair, um, as Mr Carter said, a lot of weight has been given to the fact that there is a fallback position here. There is a you know, a prior approval was granted for the use of these buildings for residential and therefore making an applicant go through the process of marketing when there is a re residential consent there in effect was not considered to be reasonable or practical and therefore it wasn't appropriate. I mean in terms of other things as well also you'll have heard from a, a local resident that the access point is on a 60 miles an hour road so therefore in terms of industrial type uses that would probably be a, a concern for the highway authority as well. And also as well, a couple of other things while I'm, while I'm talking. Um, comment was made about the five year land supply. Just to point out the class queues are not relevant to the, to the to those. It's a totally separate legislation. And the government by granting class queue rights has pretty much decided that rural buildings can be converted to homes in the countryside without needing to go through a marketing process. I appreciate the council has its own policy on that. But my view is where a class queue has been demonstrated, it would be unreasonable to make an applicant go through that process. Thank you. Chairman, can I also ask one further question? Probably. It's, a, it's on the next paragraph and it's to do with structural integrity of the building. And uh, the report says that the building has re received a class Q approval and is therefore considered to be of sufficient permanent strength and structural integrity to allow for a conversion rather than a rebuild. Now, I find that slightly hard to believe knowing what this kind of building looks like out in the field. Um, and I suspect actually a considerable amount of strengthening would be required uh, for such a building, but to sim simply to take the weight of a first floor. But um, yeah. could we have some guidance on that, please? Well, I think we've seen this a number of times, haven't we, that uh, um, the interpretation of conversion can be quite wide. But uh, yes, Mr. Norris, can you yeah. tell us about that? In, in terms of the structural integrity of the building, when the local planning authority granted the class view approval, they would have considered that. In fact, it could be a conversion rather than a rebuild. Right, OK, thank you very much. If we can move on then. I think Councillor Khan. All right, Councillor <coughs> Khan, please. Yeah, this site would, if it had been just a site in the countryside, would never have been given permission. That's clear, it's against all our policies. The, the, the problem here is that we've got this class to approval. Now, whether the class to approval should have been given is not the question. That's a fait accompli, we have that. So the real question that as I see it is that we have um, a debate between do we want to have one building rather than two? Um, it seems a very big opulent building was proposed. Uh, are, are not, uh, obviously somebody got plenty of resources, but that's not, a, that's not an issue. The point is we're going to have one building there on the site. And the alternative will be to have two separate buildings. In terms of that location and sustainability, having its isolated location is going to involve a lot of tra tra traffic. There does seem to me to be an advantage in only having one building. 
so this is an application for full planning permission uh, set against the uh, class Q, which seems to be permanent. It doesn't seem to uh, disappear. Can, can Mr. Mar uh, Norris can, can confirm that? that take uh, prior approval doesn't in three years like a, a planning permission. Am I right on that? So uh, that the last the uh, point of clarification, and I think that's right. Am I correct? It's correct. Yeah, Shall I come back on that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but uh, take, take, yes. taking the point that, the, uh, on that assumption, uh, we seem to be let, let in the position that uh, otherwise we will have buildings and have one. Uh, and, and in that case, I would tend to um, think that it's probably a better, a better deal. I would be unhappy about having a building there, but I, I, it seems to be better than the alternative. Uh, um, uh, and so I can sympathise with precisely with the uh, parish council and um, um, council Roberts' view, but I, I, I think we're rather stuck. I mean, it's a comment upon the whole uh, provision for prior approval, uh, conversion, and agricultural buildings, which has been a, a bit of a problem planning terms. But there we, we are, where we are, and that's what's presented in front of us. All right, thank you very much for that. Councillor Hawkins, I think, yeah, next. Okay. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, uh, Councillor Khan has made, um, you know, a, a very good argument is one of the things I was going to uh, talk about. I think we are where we are. This site has already got permission for use as a residential site. And yes, the question is, is it going to be one or two, which is, you know, my point to um, uh, Mr. Burke earlier on. And in my view, it's better to have one because we have less traffic. Um, and I take the point about the massing, but the massing is only from the footpath, but not from the road itself. And probably is more use, um, you know, there'll be more people passing down the road than, um, than the path. So I personally don't see that we have um, any reason to be calling for this to be uh, advertised for employment use, that horse has bolted. And so um, the question we need to ask ourselves is, is it one or is it two? And I will be voting for one. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Councillor Rippeth was next. Councillor Rippeth, please. Um, I think my points have been made by two previous speakers and I will be voting for this um, application on the basis of what's already been said. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chairman, I think Councilor, I come next myself, yep. if I may. Councillor Thane, you've got me. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, as has been stated, the fallback here is Class Q development of two, uh, conversion of two buildings. Um, the difference here is the connecting area in the middle makes it one with greater height. Now, it was questioned whether this was a redundant building because there are grain buildings being built all around. The conversion of what is a relatively low cattle building to use for modern grain facilities is not something that works easily. And I think I accept that this is a redundant building to the extent that that is still an issue following the class Q. Um, indeed, most of the structural members will be used. The difference is that the high will be um, that was raised about access. I really don't see that as an issue. Um, this is not a particularly busy. Chairman, we are and losing you. Chairman, both Chairman could we ask Councillor Fain to turn his Please. camera off? We might hear his voice better then. I'll try one more time. The question of visibility was raised. I'm satisfied that the Uh, the visibility is good then. but owned by the officers. Uh, I will now turn my camera off then if I may, Chair, uh, and yeah, hope that you all hear me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the visibility is good in both directions. I don't think that, that is a, a real issue as reflected in the highways report. So what we have is a between two bungalows making use of these buildings or one and sustainable design, something which in other circumstances might be regarded as exceptional. Um, 
in planning terms. The, the use of integrated solar panels is itself very innovative. There would be heat pumps and reuse of water on the site. The proposal is in fact the sort of building that you would expect. Um, it is a highly imaginative and sustainable reuse of an existing building with very little impact on the surrounding area and marginal impact on the view from the footpath. So I would be inclined to say we should certainly approve this building. OK, thank you very much for that. Got through in the end yeah. anyway. Good. Councillor Heather Williams. OK, Heather Williams, please, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, on, on this one, I think the the issue really is if we see it truly as a conversion of the existing buildings or the um, construction of a new one. Um, because at the end of the day, I know we have the conversion, which has already got permission, but we have different policies to deal with conversions of buildings and the establishment of new ones. Um, and the changes that are proposed are quite substantial. The fact that it's actually going to increase in height, I think, is something that gives the impression that this is not a conversion as is, as you could see it, as the two buildings would have been, but the establishment of, of a new a new one. And I think that's that's more the area for for debate. And I think the that there is the possibility for a design of one building that could be achieved without the increasing of height. Um, and so I'm I'm not saying that I support two rather than one, but I think it's pushing the limits of conversion in my view, and it's possibly taking it a little too far. Um, and that's that's my thoughts at the moment, Chairman. And there is an annex proposed, so I don't think the traffic area is actually, you know, the amount of traffic that actually that's an argument we can can run on on this one, because essentially, if you've got an annex and you've got the, the main property, although they're in the same same footprint, it is two two sort of separate family units potentially that could be be using it so i i don't see that this is going to have any less impact than two houses would have on that basis um yeah okay. that's, that's what i'm weighing up anyway okay um, thank you uh, and councillor wright i think is it yes all right councillor wright please thank you chairman um to me this application looks a good one um, it is redundant buildings in the countryside. It's a brownfield site. The red line, the movement of the red line protects the site from further development. It's substantially better design than the two falling back to the two houses and it's sustainable. You know, everything that this council is looking for. I think the planning officers has taken apart the Parish Council's objections to it by going through H17 in great detail and, you know, taking apart those uh, and giving reasons why he is supporting this application. And I think that's very clear. Um, the highway objections, we've, we've seen the photographs and, you know, with that visibility display, you know, if that's not suitable, I don't know, very few sites in this district would be suitable. Um, taking all that into account, I can't see any material reasons for refusing this application and I will be supporting it. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thanks very much for that. Um, I'll be coming to you, Councillor Roberts, in just a moment, but I understand Mr. Reid wants to comment. Mr. Reid, please. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, I can hear you. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, two, two points that I'd like to address, if I may. First is uh, a comment was made by one of our public speakers about the 
consultation issue. Uh, you've heard from the case officer that the red line application has not been amended. Uh, had the red line been amended, then I think it would have given rise to a fresh consultation. What we have is a red line which the applicant is willing to adhere to in terms of the planning unit that will benefit from the residential consent in relation to the garden area. Uh, to my mind, uh, it is therefore open to members to decide that there has been sufficient consultation and that no fresh consultation is required arising out of a condition limiting the garden area within the overall red line. The second point I think Councillor Wright has touched upon and that is, uh, is there a highway issue? Again, you've heard one of the public speakers say that the uh, comments or the representations from the Highway Authority are irrational. Um, Councillor Wright, I think, has drawn members' attention to the photo that was shown, and therefore it is open to members to decide whether they're satisfied on what you have before you that you can make a decision that there is not a highway issue notwithstanding the comments from the public speaker as to the highway authority being irrational i hope those comments are helpful <clears throat> right thank you very much uh, i believe councillor bradburn wanted some clarification on that thank you uh, thank you, Mr. Reid. I just wanted to seek clarification of your clarification, if I may, that under condition three, we've got the statement that prior to the occupation of the development, the curtilage of the approved dwellings shall be laid out and finished in accordance with the approved plan. The curtilage shall remain as such thereafter. Now, I think Mr. Norris, was it said that means that there will only be development on the ex current proposed footprint and there would not be any permission for development of the remainder of the site. Can you confirm that that's the case? So I respond, Chair. Mr. Reid, yeah. yeah. Or Mr. Norris, I think that was. Was it? I don't know. Well, I I let, let, let Mr. Reid, the question was given to him. Yes, I, I think what we're saying is that the condition addresses uh, what will be the extent of the garden area within the overall red line. So in effect, and that sounds strange, is strange, but you have two red lines, one for the purposes of the planning application and one for the purposes of limiting what will be the garden area within that overall red line. Is that sorry. helpful? No, right. sorry. What I'm trying to establish is, is there anything in either the original site plan or this curtilage plan that stop development outside the plan that dis describes the, um, the, this this plan that was the revised curtilage plan. Sorry, what I'm trying to get to is that I do not want to see any further residential development on the remainder of the site. And is there anything in these plans that protects the rest of the site from having any further residential development on it? All right, good, got that then. So, so uh, David Norris will will chip in. I hope. Um, a planning application uh, could come forward for development on the balance of the land and that would have to be considered on its merits. Uh, and yes, uh, uh, we could find that the condition, I think you said condition three, 
could be the subject of uh, of an appeal to uh, amend the the conditions such as to uh, say that they don't like the red line that they've offered up in relation to the curtilage plan, but having right. having best agree, this this is what anybody could do on any any application, isn't it? Mm. So this is just standard. Chair, you're you're absolutely right, but I wanted to make Councillor Bradman aware that that right. that's the situation simple, we always face. <laughs> Long yeah. keep, keep it simple, please. So so okay, are you happy with that, Councillor Bradman? So what we're saying is that there's no more protection than there would be on any other. Um, no, but no, but that's what I'm saying. That that actually what we could have requested was that the red line, the actual planning application red line, went around the place that is currently described as the revised curtilage. And the remainder of the site was put as a blue line, other land in the ownership well, of the council. We can only do with what we have in front of us. So I what I'm saying is that Let's without that, that protection, without that protection, development could be applied for on the remainder of the land. And we wouldn't be able to say no because it had been predisposed as such because of there being a development on the site at present. And if the red line goes all around the whole site, then one building on the site predicates development on that site. No, so it might not any, be a but anybody service. can make an application. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Not right if there. you restrict the red line to the immediate confines but of the building. Always then appeal against it. Now we're not getting anywhere, Councillor. Please let, let's try and bring this to some sort of conclusion. Now. Uh, just a quick response on that. Yes, sorry. Um, just a quick response to yes, if you must go on. Yeah. So the red line curtilage plan is the garden area. We that is just garden. The remainder of the land in the red line is open countryside, like everywhere else in the area, and it's no more vulnerable not, than any other piece of land in that location. Good. Okay. Thank you for that. Now let's hear the last word then from Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. One of the things that hasn't been pointed out, as is often when we have planning committees and when we've got something that's already got a previous approval, we, we are usually very strongly told um, and, and warned about um, considering what is in front of us on its merits and, and whatever else is there, uh, in the past, even though it's up to date, it should not be the main thing on our mind. What should be the main thing on our mind is the application that is in front of us. And I would ask again for those members who are thinking of going along with this to just give me a few thoughts and seconds on this one. Because what we had given was a very basic two smallish bungalows. Um, there wasn't going to be any great height change in them. They were bungalows. Um, and though I still was upset about that because it was in the open countryside, it went through because of various reasons. However, what is in front of us today is a different beast altogether. This is a building that is going to be extended. It's going to be ripped apart, it, all that's going to be left of it, uh, if at all, are four metal posts. How do members quantify and qualify that that fits in with our planning policies? Our planning policies are quite clear. No new build in the countryside in this manner unless it, fit, it actually fits in with proper criteria. This application is a new build in the countryside that does not fit in with any of our criteria or policies. I would suggest it's completely unacceptable to be putting this sort of thing as agreeable and acceptable because it's not. 
that area between Shepworth uh, and Falmere is very special. We're not the most beautiful area in South Cairns, but for us, that is very special. There is nothing along there that is a domestic dwelling of any kind. And now some of you are going along with the notion that it's OK to build a large new house there, which will not contain anything of the old building whatsoever. And I would just say, I'm really sad about that. I'm really sad that you have so little care for your own policies and your own countryside. Go along with this if you will, but you know, I'm just at a loss to understand how you can go along with that. This is not a barn conversion. It's a new house in the countryside. Thank you very much. Can I uh, presume you got to vote for refusal? Can, of course. Um, and the grounds for that is, is under policy H17, as suggested by the parish council. Is that? Uh, Chairman, can I just add something here? Yeah, go on. The, there is some some wording within um, the officer's report which talks about um, a, a survey that had been undertaken that proved it. I would suggest that. I'm sure that that survey was done by the applicants. Um, and of course, if you pay for something, you'll get what you pay for. You'll get the answer you want. Yeah, all right. However, so I would suggest that we can say that the, given all the information about what's going to be taken away, what's going to be left, we can actually say it does not comply with a con the barn conversion. It is a new build in the countryside. You will have to remind me, or officers will have to remind me what okay. policy number that comes under. But uh, it's a it, new it, build it, in the countryside and contrary to policy. Yeah. OK, new. So new build you're going for. Yeah. yeah. OK. Right. Uh, now I have a note from Mr. Reid. Um, that I need to ask you, uh, members of the committee, to confirm that you have assessed highway matters for themselves uh, and taken on board what you've heard today and you are um, happy with the highways suggestion. Um, can I take that as the case? Yes, I am. Yes. Yes. Agreed. Yes. Yes. OK, fine. Yes. Lovely. And on consultation too. Right, thank you very much. Um, I just go to Mr Carter for a moment. Um, the um, there, are, there may be some votes for refusal, so the basis of that um, I've got that uh, they're taking the view of this is new build and not conversion, contrary to policy. I think H17 is it? Uh, Chair, yes, thank you. Um, I had uh, had written some words, but uh, along slightly different lines, um, which was that uh, notwithstanding the extent class Q permission, the proposal by virtue of the increased bulk and visual impact would be harmful to the rural character of the surrounding area, contrary to policy HQ1 of the local plan, um, rather than it being a new bill. But I'm just... Um, can, we, can we add height as well as bulk, please, Chris? Yes, uh, so by virtue of the increased... Uh, height, bulk and visual impact. And materials being used? D uh, well, the, the materials are... Well, can um, you, can you, could you put in that, in fact, the lack of anything that's retained? Yeah, all right. I, I think there's, there's more, more than enough. Either. Yeah, I think what I've got enough information up? there to, uh, to put it together if necessary. OK, so Thank we've, you, we've got that. Uh, I've got another note from Mr. Reid, uh, and also, are you satisfied that you're OK on the consultation issue? Is Can I take a yes for that, please? Yes. Agree. Yes. Yes. Right. That one again? Yes. Yes. Great. All right, so let's tie this one up then, and let's go to uh, a vote. So uh, the proposal is um, for approval with conditions. If you're in favour of approval, you're for. If you're against, you're for a refusal. And if you want to abstain, you abstain. So for is approval, uh, against is refusal. So uh, do the roll call now.
Councillor Bradman, please. I'm finding this very hard, um, but I think I'm reluctantly going to have to vote for. Four. Oh, thank you. Councillor Calm. Uh, four. Four. Oh, thank you. Councillor Thane. Four. Four. Oh. Councillor Hawkins, please. Four. Four. Oh. Councillor Ripith. Four. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Against. Against, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Against. Against, thank you. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Um, four. Four. Councillor Wright. Four, Chairman. Thank you very much. And I'm four. The result is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Is eight two. This is therefore approved. Outrageous. Okay, thank you very much for that. We now move on to agenda item 11, which is the enforcement report on page 95 of our committee papers. Unfortunately, the enforcement officer cannot be with us today because has a funeral commitment. Um, Mr Carter is available uh, to try and field questions should you have them. Thank you Chair, just briefly to remind members that there was a supplemental report from the enforcement officer um, with regard to Smithy Fenn um, and with regard to both that report and the main report itself um, what I propose to do is if there are questions I will need to take those away to confer with the enforcement team and then uh, revert back to either individual members or, or the entire committee on those issues. Okay. Uh, just before we do that, I just note that Councillor Ripith is uh, leaving us now as she has another meeting. So thank you very much, Councillor Ripith. Um, any questions then? Yes, uh, Councillor Bradnam, please. Yes, uh, thank you. I wanted to thank enforcement officers very much for finally serving a notice at uh, Fen Road, Milton. Um, it's in. Uh, it's it's written down as land northeast of 76 Fen Road, Chesterton. I don't think that's the right address. It's Fen Road, Milton. Um, it's land northeast of Fen Road, 76 Fen Road, Milton. Um, and uh, we're very glad that an enforcement notice was finally served. Um, but what I wanted to ask Mr Carter, please, is that enforcement could be on the alert as the as the weather becomes nicer in the spring because I think it, the use will start up again um, and also since 28 days has passed since the issue of that notice and the land has not been reinstated uh, there was a requirement to remove the track and reinstate it as a pasture um, and none of those tracks have been removed yet so I'd like to just clarify when that could be done when the enforcement action could be taken. Thank you, Councillor Bradman. Yes, I'll, I'll take those away uh, and ask the enforcement officer to respond to you directly on those points. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, would like to raise something? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm happy to do my um, appeals question at the same time if that helps speed things up. Uh, but on enforcement, I was just looking at the year to date figures for 2020 obviously there's been been a reduction um which you would understand this year but also on the amount closed is quite a significant reduction compared to the previous years um and when i looked at the monthly figures we could see there was a bit of a particularly august um i was just wondering if we've if we've identified a reason for that and hopefully overcome whatever reason that may be because of the october we we did clear more than we received. So just um, seeking a bit of reassurance that that was a short prob uh, short term problem and that's been resolved. Um, would you like me to ask my appeal question now? Um, no, it's all right. I, we will come back to that. I'm sorry. I, I think we're just losing another person. I'm afraid, yeah, Councillor Khan has had to leave now. Um, Cheerio, oh. Councillor Khan. Councillor Wright is next, I think. Yeah, Councillor Wright, please. 
Thank you, Chairman. And my questions relate to Smithy Fenn. Yep. Um, I'm concerned about the the work that's going on in there involving large plant and that sort of thing. One of the neighbours has notified me about it, and I was wondering. I was hoping to speak to the enforcement officer today about it, um, but he, if he's not there, he can't re respond. But uh, there, there is large plant. There has been work on Sexual Drove and Smithy Fen, and uh, I was wondering if uh, we could have a report on the large plant and work that are going on in there with uh, on some of our injunction sites. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much for that. This is a car through. I'm sure you're taking that on board. Yeah. yeah thank you, Councillor White. I'll, I'll ask the enforcement officer to contact you directly in the first instance um, to discuss that matter. OK, thank you. I think we've done that one then and we move on. Chair to... then, will I get yep. a response to my question from Mr Carter? Or... Well, I'm not sure Mr Carter can respond. He's just taking that away to get an answer for you, I think. Yeah, sorry, Councillor Williams. Um, I, I don't have an answer as to why fewer cases have been closed. But um, again, I, I will find out. I'm afraid I'm not directly involved in the management of the enforcement team. So um, I, I can certainly take that away and find out for you, though. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. We're now on agenda item 12, then on page 103, which are appeal decisions. Worth noting that all the current ones have been dismissed. Uh, any comments on this, uh, Mr Carter? No comments, Chair, but as previous months, um, I'll propose to circulate those appeal decisions to the committee um, following this meeting. Apologies, I should, should have done that beforehand, but um, uh, I will do that just for, for members' interest. Thank you, okay, Chair. Fine. Thank you very much. Anything else, members? Mr Carter or? Nope. So we're at the end of the meeting then. Chairman, so yes, I sir. have an appeal question and I have indicated. And me. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. Who have I missed? I didn't catch your name. Me and yeah, Councillor right. Tommy Hall. Williams, yeah. Um, it was just on page 109. Yes, yeah, sorry. The, on the informal hearings, the, the first two, uh, the land at Mill Lane, Thorston. Yep. It says the 9th of November to be confirmed. Obviously, we're past the 9th of November. So just to um, find out how did that informal hearing go ahead? Um, and are we able to have a, an update on yep. that and the grounds of which? Mr. Re Mr. Reid is keen to tell us all about it. Oh, lovely. Um, uh, the planning inspector omitted to send out uh, notice, so they had to uh, postpone that meeting, that uh, appeal, and we're waiting for a new date. Chairman, well, can I just ask the, the grounds on which they're appealing on that site? Uh, I mean, it might be a bit deeper. Uh, Councillor Roberts, you've still got your camera on. I don't know if you, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm afraid I don't have details of the, the, the grounds of appeal. I'm just dealing with the planning obligation matters. OK. Could it be uh, sent you, you have to uh, pursue that outside this meeting, and I think it's Councillor Williams. Sorry. Chair, Chair, if I may, um, it, if given it's a live appeal, um, the appellant's grounds of appeal should be on the uh, the council's planning portal um, under the relevant application reference. So um, their grounds of appeal should be uh, there for anyone to read. Um, but I'll see if we can uh, we can uh, circulate something that summarises it for you if, if that's been submitted by the applicant. Right. Thank you very much for that. I have a couple more questions, I think. Um, Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's the uh, decisions notified on pages 105 and 106. Yep. I said these were have all been dismissed, and I think uh, it shows that the original decisions were very good decisions. Absolutely. So, uh, acknowledge that to the officers and members of the committee. Thank you. Yep. Good. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I know I have no further speakers, so I just let you need to let you know that our next meeting will be Wednesday the 9th of December at 10 o'clock.
uh, thank everybody who's taken part, uh, thanking the public for watching, and thank you members and officers for your attention today. It's just after four o'clock and uh, we've got a, a short day, uh, the mere six hours today. So well done everybody. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.